stunning admission from President Biden. He now says if Donald Trump was not running for president in 2024, he's not sure that he would also be in the race. Those comments today at a fundraiser in Boston. Let's bring in CNN political director David Chalian. David, an incredibly candid admission by President Biden. What do you make of it? Well, we had seen a lot of previous reporting, including our own here at CNN, that there's no doubt that Trump was a motivating factor, of course, Jake, uh, in Biden's thinking about running for re-election. But as Biden is wont to do in these uh, scenarios where he's behind closed doors, he kind of reveals his innermost thoughts. And what we're seeing here is a real, clearly defined rationale for Biden pursuing re-election despite his current political standing, which is not that great in the polls, obviously, the conversation about his age and concern among Democrats if he is the best candidate to put forward. What Joe Biden is making clear with these comments, he clearly thinks, because he said also Democrats cannot let Trump win uh, as a part of his comments, say he clearly thinks he is the single best Democrat. An opportunity here uh, to talk about Joe Biden being so more focused on him uh, than anything else. But I do think if Joe Biden's uh, critical mission at this time is starting to piece back his coalition of voters, some of which he's seen a diminishment of support, reminding those voters of the contrast with Donald Trump and that Donald Trump is the target here could help rally the troops, if you will. Interesting. David, stick around. Uh, I also want to bring in CNN's Kristen Holmes and Michael LaRosa, former special assistant to President Biden. Uh, but Michael, you work for uh, President Biden. Um, have you heard him say this before behind closed doors? And are you surprised he admitted this to people um, outside the White House? Well, we always heard him say, or everybody, the way everybody always spoke about a second term was never in doubt. It was always, you know, nobody runs for president uh, for four years. And you know what? I, I kind of believe that. The guy has been trying to run for president his entire life. I don't believe that he'd be, he'd be willingly um, giving up the presidency on his own if it were not Donald Trump. However, I would, I, I would like to see him start being more candid in public. I think these news making events through pool reports are getting a little uh, are a little weak uh he needs to start being candid with everybody and and first of all as david mentioned a longtime clinton person once told me fail to plan plan to fail what if it isn't donald trump what what if the contrast is him and nikki haley i don't know if anybody any democrat including the white house wants that contrast in, in my lifetime, we haven't seen a primary turnout exactly the way it started. John Kerry had to remortgage his house in order to, because everybody thought he was dead. Nobody thought Bernie Sanders would be taking Hillary Clinton to the convention. And, uh, you know, I remember in 2007 when Charlie Cook said uh, Hillary was a freight train and Obama should get out of her way. None of these primaries end up the way they start. And I would mm -hmm. just caution, uh, you know, yeah. When you say, what if it is Nikki Haley? I mean, all polls indicate that Nikki Haley would demolish Joe Biden in a one-on-one, -on -one, although who knows? That's just a poll. It's not an actual election result. How do you think Donald Trump, as somebody who covers him, how do you think Donald Trump will react to his saying this? I mean, I believe that the Trump campaign is likely to piece this together and serve it as red meat to the base. Uh, we will like to hear from Donald Trump tonight on this. He's going to be doing a town hall with Fox News instead of going to the debate tomorrow night. But this really is part of his argument overall, is that Biden is personally out to get him, that Democrats and Biden are out to get him. That's why they are, quote unquote, targeting him with these indictments. And that is going to be part of this. They're saying, you know, essentially, and what I just heard from one Republican operative, this is an opportunity for Trump's campaign to say, look, they really are actually after him. He doesn't even want to run for, to be president of this country. It's all specific to Donald Trump. The, these comments, as you know, make it clear that Biden believes he is the only Democrat um, that can beat Donald Trump. Because if he thought that Kamala Harris or
Let's move uh, to a, a more important story in terms of domestic politics, which is how Americans are feeling about all of this that is happening in front of us. Let's go ahead and put this up there on the screen. So this is some pretty extraordinary polling um, that has just come out from Gallup. And I want to actually spend some time here. Americans' views of military Israelis, Israel's military action in Gaza by subgroup. So if you look at it by adults, it's 50% approve, 45% disapprove. I think very different than how most people would look in the media. When you start to break it down, though, by age, it's extraordinary. 18 to 34, uh, you in that age group, you have 30% approve, 67% disapprove. 35 to 54, so Gen X, you have 50 approve, 44% disapprove. And then amongst boomers, it's more significantly 63% approve, 34% disapprove. I do think, though, if you look at the breakdown uh, where things really split, it's party ID. So you've got 71% of Republicans who approve of the Israeli military actions in Gaza, 23% disapprove. Amongst independents, it's almost entirely equally split. 47% approve, 48% disapprove. Amongst Democrats, absolutely extraordinary to see this number. 36% approve, 63% disapprove. And of course, a Democrat is currently um, in the White House. Now, you shouldn't conduct all foreign policy just to pay based upon what your party wants necessarily. But Crystal, this does highlight something that we've been trying to bring attention to here, which is not even just young voters per se, but many Democrats who may feel very differently about the Israel conflict, who don't see their views really represented in their in the government that is, or at least in the party and the president uh, that they are aligned with in a critical election year. And I thought that that was the biggest red sign I've seen yet um, for President Joe Biden, on top of all of his other problems, it explains why Trump right now is in the best position to win re-elections for any Republican since George W. Bush in 2004. And it's not just that they don't see their view reflected in the United States government. And by the way, of course, consistently from the beginning, the overwhelming majority of Americans, some two thirds of Americans have supported a ceasefire. Not only do they not see those views reflected in large numbers outside of a few courageous members of Congress, but they've been treated with absolute contempt, smeared as Hamas or terrorist sympathizers, smeared as anti-Semites. You know, there's a new resolution up in the House to equate anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism, which is absolutely preposterous. Now, I did see Jerry Nadler and some others speaking out against that. That is good to see. But that is the level of contempt that, you know, young people and people of color, who that's the other interesting divide here is that the two real um, divides in terms of support for Israel or opposition to what Israel is doing here were generational. So young people, you know, far more disgusted with Israel's campaign in Gaza than older people. And then there's a huge racial divide as well. And you actually see this represented in the members of Congress who have been for a ceasefire effectively from the beginning. They're overwhelmingly on the younger side and they're overwhelmingly people of color. There were effectively no white Democrats who calling for a ceasefire for quite some time. It took a while. So hmm. those two um, parts of the Democratic base, obviously being very large and very critical, is why then you see this huge party identification divide in terms of support for Israel. I also don't want to miss the top line here. You know, you might look at it, okay, there's still a little bit of narrow, you know, 50% support what Israel's up to, 45% opposed. That is a remarkable shift. Yes, it from is. From not only the early days of this war, but from how Americans have viewed um, Israeli actions in the past for years and years and years. I mean, that should be sending shockwaves through DC. And I think it is. I mean, that's why you see these groups like, APAC and Democratic majority for uh, for for Israel coming out and saying, oh, we're going to spend all this money, we're going to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to try to quash any sort of dissent on this issue because they can see the way that they are losing the messaging and propaganda war with young people. And they are even lose, losing some of their grip on a uh, uniformity of opinion, even in the mainstream press. So that's why you see such a freak out there. But yeah, for for Biden, this is a complete disaster. You have far more Republicans supporting effectively his foreign policy than his own party. And you can only imagine, you know, if this was Trump with the same policies as Biden, you would have like uniform Democratic opposition to what was going on here. So especially given the amount of propaganda people are consistently fed from the U.S. press, 
to see a 50-50 overall divide and to see these kind of generational and racial and uh, party splits as well is, uh, it's extraordinary. It really yeah. is a remarkable turn. It's also important to know uh, that is very different than even conflicts which have now become much more 50-50 or even in the case of Ukraine have switched entirely in terms of how Americans feel about aid. If you look at the initial numbers on Ukraine, it was almost 90-10 in terms of people um, who were supportive of initial military aid. It took over a year, probably 18 months before reality started to set in. Uh, and we will talk quite a bit about that today. But nonetheless, from an electoral perspective, I think Biden certainly does face a problem. We flagged this report. Let's go ahead and put this up there on the screen. Swing state Muslim leaders are now launching a campaign to, quote, abandon Biden in 2024. They're specifically trying to leverage the uh, Muslim populations in Michigan, in Minnesota, Arizona, Wisconsin, Florida, and Georgia, and Nevada, and Pennsylvania, calling on the campaign, quote, abandon Biden, vowing to ensure Biden is a one-term president. Leaders have run separate pressure campaigns in these respective states, now are banding together to try and get the hashtag trending uh, and to try and to have organization. They say that the bubbling anger amongst Arab and Muslim, uh, Muslim Americans could threaten Biden's chances of re-election in many of these swing states in 2024 in key voting blocks. And one of the reasons why I think it really matters uh, to break this down is the vote total in Georgia is only a couple of thousand. In Arizona, we're talking about 10,000 votes. If you combine Pennsylvania, Georgia, Arizona, you only need 30, 40,000 votes to go in a different direction. And Trump is at, back in the White House and 2020 looks a hell of a lot different. I don't think yet that a lot of political analysis has caught up with just the slimmest margins by which Biden even won the presidency in 2020 and how precarious his chances are. Even the White House, everybody seems to be swaggering, being like, oh, there's there's no way or they're not taking it seriously. The DNC, a lot of the Democratic, you know, uh, the uh, chattering class. Just yesterday, we covered the story that they're anointing Biden, the, de the nominee from the state of Florida. They're not even allowing democracy or any of that to creep in. So I think they're going to get smacked in the face come October of uh, 2024, Crystal, when all of this just comes to a head. And they're looking at their internals three weeks, one month out to election day, and they're gonna be like, oh my God, this is a totally different election than we expected. Almost like a Hillary oh shit moment from 2016 that was happening, at least in some parts of her campaign, but she didn't want to listen to. They still believe that this will just blow over, that young people, that Arab Americans, that Muslim Americans, when they're faced with the alternative of Trump and you know his floating of a Muslim ban and wanting to ban from the country anyone who is Palestinian or supports the Palestinian cause, that they will suck it up and vote for Joe, that they'll move on or they'll forget that any of this ever happened. And I just think that they're completely wrong in that. And you, the greatest effort that you see in order to win people over is not to change the policy, is not to try to allay their concerns, it's to effectively berate and shame them yes. for, you know, quote unquote, like voting to end democracy by not just getting on board with Joe Biden, who is complicit with these uh, Israeli atrocities that we all see unfolding in front of our eyes every single day. So listen, you can make the lesser evil argument. That's fine. You know, I do think Donald Trump is worse. I've may have been very clear about it, but it's always the responsibility of the voters rather than responsibility of Joe Biden, his administration, and the party leadership. And frankly, I just don't think it's going to work this time. These um, Muslim leaders who are organizing this effort, they were asked about exactly this. And they said that they are not planning to vote for Donald Trump, though they recognize their effort to rally support against Biden could elevate the former president. But they said they're going to continue to have discussions about which candidate to throw their support behind as the primaries rapidly approach. Quote, we're not supporting Trump, we're not going to make the same mistake of thinking about President Biden the way we thought. We don't have two options. We do want to start tonight by talking about a world leader who has a history of projecting onto his opponents what he himself is actually doing. On February 27th of 2014, a group of Russian men wearing green uniforms 
and no identifying military insignia, took over the capital of Ukraine's Crimean Peninsula and even raised a Russian flag above the building. In the days that followed, these little green men, as they were called, took over Ukrainian military bases and important facilities. But despite what was clearly a Russian-led campaign with Russian military to illegally annex a part of a neighboring country, the Kremlin denied all involvement. When President Putin was asked about the role of Russian soldiers, he completely flipped the argument around. And he flipped, flipped it around and claimed, quote, those were local self-defense units. When the reporter pushed him on the fact that the uniforms looked a whole lot like those worn by the Russian army, he even claimed that, quote, you can go to a store and buy that kind of uniform. Easy to find. His argument was basically that it wasn't the Russians who were attacking Ukraine, but instead it was the West who was attacking the Russian people. And this was all simply a matter of self-defense. Now, I was at the State Department at the time, standing at the podium in every day, and while we aggressively called out the invasion, landing me, by the way, on the list of favorite Kremlin targets, we were often on our back heels because the Russians had no shame. They took no shame in lying and blurring the lines to create such confusion that it was hard to tell what was fact and what was fiction. We've seen Putin continue to use this tactic over the course of the last nearly two years, try to, I should say, claiming Ukraine was on a path to using nuclear weapons, really shatting it from the rooftops, when in reality, it was Russia. Also a country, by the way, with one of the largest nuclear arsenals in the world. They were the ones threatening to use them. Last February, Putin gave a speech claiming it was the West who started the war in Ukraine. Not that military invasion, of course, we all saw happen with our own eyes. This pattern of accusing others of what you are in fact doing yourself is a classic Kremlin tactic. But if this pattern of projecting onto your opponents what you're actually doing sounds familiar, it's because one of Putin's biggest admirers is using the same tactics right here in the United States. Just this weekend, in a speech in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, Donald Trump said this about President Biden. Joe Biden is not the defender of American democracy. Joe Biden is the destroyer of American democracy. And it's, it's him and his people that think they can do whatever they want, break any law, tell any lie, ruin any life, trash any norm, and get away with anything they want. Now, if you've ever heard Donald Trump speak, and I bet you have, you know he says a lot of things, often off the cuff. But that was not one of those times, and that's important, because this was on purpose. This was part of a strategy. You can literally see that in the black and white on signs that Trump's campaign passed out at the same event that say Biden attacks democracy. And you can see it in a video posted to Truth Social later that night, captioned, Crooked Joe Biden and the Anti-Democratic Party. Not exactly subtle. This claim, of course, comes from the man who tried to overturn our last election. The man who accuses Democrats of vote rigging when he is the one who has been criminally charged with defrauding American voters. Now, Trump's projection is an obvious attempt to muddy the water. Sound familiar? To blur the line between fact and fiction. To confuse voters about the actual threat and to mess with their ability to recognize what is real. If everyone is corrupt, then no one is corrupt, right? That's the point. This is a tactic you might find on a playground, too. A child saying, yeah, I know you are, but what am I? We've all experienced that. Or you might also find it in Vladimir Putin's Russia. And projection. All right, so we got some big news that just came out from Politico. Uh, apparently, Florida Democrats have decided unilaterally, we're not having a primary election. They, they actively decided we will do no democratic process whatsoever. 
even though Marianne Williamson has been in the race against Biden for quite a while now, even though Dean Phillips launched recently, even though Jank jumped in, even though he's got court cases to get through. But putting Jank aside, I mean, just think Dean Phillips and Marianne Williamson. There's no legal challenges on that front. They are definitely opponents to Joe Biden. Whether or not you agree with them, that's irrelevant. That doesn't matter. So the state of Florida, let me explain to you how this works. So mm -hmm. um, the way it works in that state is that like the party submits a list of the people to be on the ballot, which already is sort of weird, right? Right. Uh, and it was supposed to be on December, December 1st. It was either November 1st or December 1st. But what happened was a month before that, mm -hmm. the Florida Democrats decided we're going to release our list now without telling anybody, without warning anybody about an earlier deadline. And the list just had Joe Biden on it. So then Dean Phillips the other day tries to tries to get his name on the ballot and they go, oh, I'm sorry, we can't help you. We've already done the list and you're not on it. And he's like, well, hold on. You said the you said it was this date was the the final date to submit. And they're like, oh, yeah, we changed that and moved it a month earlier. It's like, OK, well, you didn't tell anybody that. He's like, well, what do you want me to tell you? It's over. It's done. You can't get on this ballot. And then they just canceled the primary, right? They canceled because the primary. No competition. To well, it. Right. And so Dean Phillips goes on uh, Twitter and, you know, yet again, he said this the other day, he apologized to Bernie Sanders for saying, I thought it was sour grapes when you were saying the DNC was rigging it against you. Now I know firsthand they're definitely rigging it against uh, against all the can other candidates that are not named Joe Biden. And so. He releases a video and he's basically like, this is flat out authoritarian. You don't believe in the democratic process at all. You're unilaterally deciding as a state party that voters don't get to have a say in any way, shape or form. And he says, look, this is like Iran. Like you're being authoritarian like Iran or like any other, you know, a dictatorship type country. So then Florida Democrats see that statement and they come back out and they play the, how dare you game? I'm so offended you would compare us to Iran, a terrorist nation. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to a special edition of the, this is the first time I'm saying this, Nick Rome and CJ show late night with Brent coming to you live late night. I'm one of your hosts. We're starting out. I'm CJ. What's up, Rome? What's going on, man? What's going on? <laughs> it's, it's hilarious. <laughs> hey, you watch that right there. It's so funny right there, Rome, at the end where he's like, boohooing like imitating the florida democrats boohoo you're calling me iran it's like aren't you boohooing about the democrats rigging the election <laughs> isn't this what we told people rome isn't this what we told people when we first heard about marianne williamson really before marianne williamson yeah. before we even knew she was running like of course we're not running this game again but they want us to go through the same feelings of hurt and disgust and sorrow, Rome. They want us to, to relive all I, these same feelings. I keep telling them. I'm, I keep telling. <laughs> I told people back when uh, well, this is when we was going at the Tim Black, and I and I said this about Kyle Kalinske. He's gonna put up a fight, and then then when the other people comes like, oh, now it's time to fight the Republicans. You know, what I'm saying now it's time to be a Democrat. Now it's time. To, like, no, 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 no. You knew this was gonna come. You knew even if she was gonna get, you know, uh. <laughs> On the ballot, she's not even close to winning. She's not going to be close to winning because they already picked the fucking winners behind closed doors, but uh, just like they told us they do. Yeah. Um, let's listen to a little bit more, but first, let me just show everybody the headline. If you haven't heard the news, you by now you haven't, you probably heard the news. RBN is kind of behind in stories because we took a break and and our editor, Aaron, is going through something. Everybody, you know, send your prayers and blessings out, real prayers and blessings out to Aaron, if you believe in that. If not, just, just some good vibes out to Aaron and her husband. But this, let me show you this article. Um, I know you've seen this headline, but this is what everybody's talking about. This is this is the story. I'll read it and I'll get to the uh, reading it in just a second after we listen to a little bit more of Kyle Kalinske. But let me read the headline. It's from Politico. It says... Florida Democrats plan to cancel presidential primaries enraging Dean Phillips campaign. The guy, <laughs> the guy who has no chance, not even no chance, but that really nobody is even really taken seriously. I don't know anybody who says, gee, uh, in the primaries, I can't vote, wait to vote for, you know, Dean <laughs> I, I never heard of this dude. <laughs> but it, it ain't even any, it ain't even a point that. Uh, he has no no uh no chance of winning. The point is, in the in the democracy, 
you anybody should be able to run. Even I should be able to run for president, right? True. And if I yeah. had me, uh, if I met those, uh, you know, uh, all the things that they wanted me to get and all that shit, and I get so many people to vote for me or how many fucking percentages it is, then you know what I'm saying we have we should have the right to do that. But this is what RBN has been telling you guys: like you do not live in a democracy. You don't even live in a republic. This is corporate fascism, you know, like even during the pandemic, we seen who control the, the, the laws. When when the airlines rewrote laws, that should have told y'all right then and there, right? It's crazy. Factual. Uh, so let, let me, let's just, let's take them to school, uh, Rome. You, we're building a library out in Detroit. So Rome is in a in a way a professor. Maybe we'll start calling them professor. <laughs> professor. Oh, no. That'll be a dope name. We call you the professor since you had a library over there. But let let me show you uh, this. We were just talking about it. This we don't have a democracy, and like Rome says, not even a republic. Let me tell you what a plutocracy is, and let me let me hit this button so I'm, you can see. I'm plutocracy. Saying. Plutocracy. All right, uh, government by wealth. What you say, it, it, like in the shortest terms, literally four words, Rome, what would you say that's accurate? Government by wealth. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And then I'll just read the full uh, uh, definition for those that are only listening. A country or society governed by wealth. Um, and that's what we have. How else do you explain, for example, Rome, how how do we why are we watching Bill Gates talk about COVID? While we yeah, watch okay. it, yeah, Michael Bloomberg talk about this. Why are we hearing uh Warren Buffett's opinion on something that has nothing to do or because wealth is governing um our uh society? So I just wanted to uh bring you and, and these and these celebrities or the or the mascots. I seen a motherfucker from Jersey Shore, I'm not sure of his name. Oh, you mean in one he, of those shows? Flick back. This nigga was talking about economics on the fucking news. <laughs> Couldn't believe it. You talking about from that TV show? Yeah, a Jersey show. What? Yes, it's like a it's like a Lupe Fiasco fucking bar just came in real life. Bro. <laughs> I just couldn't believe it. I'm like, what the fuck? What the fuck is this? Uh, <laughs> All right. Um... So let's let's listen to a little bit more. And by the way, uh, Ajamu and Nick will be joining at the top of the hour. Um, this was originally scheduled for 8 p.m., but I was like, oh, I want to go early. Or Roman, I was like, we're going to go early. We want to cover a couple of other stories before uh, Ajamu gets here. So that's why you have us here a little bit early. Don't forget to hit that like button. Back to the video with uh, Kyle Kalinske and Crystal. Let's listen to uh, Jay-Z and Beyonce talk a little politics right here. Are you going to answer the specific criticism of you just ended democracy in your state for the primary? Are you going to respond to that or are you just going to dodge it? And of, and of course they dodged it. And so now here we are. Jank was tweeting. No, they're like Ken and Barbie in reverse. He has the blonde hair and she has the uh, brunette, brunette hair. You got the balls. Maybe that. <laughs> maybe that can, maybe that can be what I'm saying, but I because I heard you laugh when I said Jay Z. That's what I. That's who they are. They're the Jay Z Beyonce yeah. of our lefty politics. So um, let's listen to some more. <laughs> tweeting about this the other day when the news came out, I saw Marianne Williamson tweeting about this as well. Dean Phillips, I mean, they're gonna. I think Dean Phillips is trying to take them to court, but like this part of the strategy is, yeah, okay, we'll tie you up in court, and you're still gonna end up getting nowhere. It's gonna cost you hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars to go through the court process right. and nothing's going to come of it anyway. So when the party decides we are going to do this, that's it. It's over. It's and unbelievable. It's unbelievable. And it's enabled by, I mean, they have really pushed this idea that to save democracy, we have to end democracy basically. Like we can't afford to have democracy. You you guys have, have you guys have, and if we had Push, I can't believe process, she said that, that because be and that's of course she said the same thing in the interview or the debate with Bree. If I don't know if you ever watched the, it was Kyle and and, and it was Jay Z and Beyonce. That's easier for me to say. It was Jay Z and Beyonce versus uh, Bree, and they were selling to Bree. Joe Biden is saying, "Yeah, it's a choice between real democracy and not." I remember in that debate, yes. 
that were saying that, but now she's trying to act like they're the ones saying it in this uh, instance. But what do they really want to have? Okay, let's say they, they have a want primary. to make it look like we're fighting, we're trying. Look, you know what I'm saying? We're all about democracy, right? But at the end of the motherfucking day, when it's Trump versus Biden, like we all know it's going to be, what is Kyle going to be telling you guys? I mean, yeah, Biden is fucked up and we're at war, genocide, blah, blah, but it's going to get worse. And he's going to start talking all fast and shit, right? Trying to get you guys to go back under the, like every time I'm telling you guys, every fight, every organization that these guys have built, Kyle Kalinske, Nina Turner, TYT, all of them has turned into a back door into the Democratic Party. You thinking that you leading with unions and all that? And blah, no, <laughs> you're going right back. To the Democratic Party, and this is all he's going to lead you to. He want to make it look like he's actually doing something, but in all reality, he's just trying to save face because he knows he's going to suck biting dick when it's time to get on this motherfucking knees. When it's time to like, so like a good right. boy, he's going to get down just like the rest of them. Him. He's going to sound just even like David with, Pacman. He's going to sound just like the rest of them. Even with the Palestinian stuff, like right now, they think people are going to just forget 10 months later that all we saw all these dead bodies like they really believe that um and these people who was just pushing remember how they was just pushed like i said in the debate with brianna they were just pushing joe biden hard now all of this is coming out now everybody's kind of on joe biden but you notice all their critiques and they're always saying so-and-so is not going to vote for him don't that group is not they never say i'm not going to vote for him they never say that part but let's uh let's listen a little more. Let me know if you want to uh, stop by anything they said. It's complete bullshit, and it's insane on its face. Like to save democracy, we have to kill democracy. We can't have democracy. It's absurd, and it really reveals that they actually don't believe in democracy. They actually don't have faith in the people to be able to evaluate choices responsibly and come to a decision that they believe is in their best interest. It's really incredible to have it so brazen, especially when, I mean, at this point, like Joe Biden is not in any real danger. You know, Marion is the last poll I saw had like Marion at eight and Dean Phillips at four and they didn't. Right. So again, then the question has to be, Rome, you heard her just say it. Then why all the tears? If you, by your own admission, like 30 seconds later after your tears dried up, you're saying, they don't really have a shot. So you're saying you just want to play dress up is essentially uh, with these progressives. They want to go through the motions because that's how they keep people engaged. Money flowing. Oh, yeah. That's how they keep people engaged into this uh, uh, rotten system. But let, let's get to some other receipts here. I got I got a bunch on this topic because, like I said, uh, Rome, um, I know you've been doing work in a library and on the ground, but they've been really crying um about this and i don't want to say it too bad because i am going to show nina turn a nina turner tweet and i think of all the rbn members i am the nicest one i i still <laughs> yeah. i still like i like her as a person i like her personality i like i know people like that she, the way she is is very la especially her hairstyle just her her demeanor her cadence so um i am going to be bringing up some receipts of her talking so not everybody I would I would classify it as that, but I'm going to lead up to something, too, which is um, tomorrow, another live stream. I'm going to announce at the end of this, when I scroll up, you'll see what I mean, Rome. Hopefully you can join tomorrow after you see what I show you in just a second. So he, he, this is the uh, photographic headline, if we want to put that up here. Let's put the photographic headline up. Um, and I guess this is a picture of Dean Phillips voting or doing something or trying to fill out the paperwork to register it says florida democrats plan to cancel pr a presidential primary enraging uh dean phillips campaign and then the the uh uh sub uh, title there rome says the representative says the state party has deliberately moved to keep him off the ballot <laughs> florida dems say he is acting unbecoming i don't know what that means uh unbecoming but this this is this is literally hilarious for me and here's one of the um let me let me show you some of the tweets first let me click that so it opens up another 
pass it, Jared. But um, here's one of the tweets. Here's Margaret Kimberly. Let's start here, and then we'll go to Lady Bunny's tweet there. Here's Margaret Kimberly um, Rome, and she's saying Florida Democrats aren't holding a primary. They are just handing the state over to Biden. This has the smell of Hillary all over again. What do you think she means by that? This has the smell of Hillary, like Hillary, like Joe Biden losing, or what do you mean? Oh, yeah. What do you think she means by that? Oh yeah, it's, 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 and when he loses, these these court members are going to be <laughs> are going to be everywhere. The same people they're going to be crying. They're going to be like, oh my god, I can't believe. You know, people didn't actually vote for Joe. Like people probably would have. Like you know what? I just go ahead. But now that you you give me no choice, shit. Man, yeah. What? Watch this. Watch this. Like Hillary, she she was like, shit. I ain't got to go to Michigan. The fuck. I know she's did the NAFTA deal and just <laughs> fucked over all their all, all their housing and just took their jobs and shipping overseas. But shit, we got this. <laughs> what a bunch of blacks and rednecks. Oh yeah, we got that. Yeah, you thought. Where were you that night, by the way? Like, uh, what was your reaction to that? that <laughs> like, people were damn near like I was. I was. You would go to a store. People was like glued to the TV. Like, what the? Like, what the fuck? Shock looks on their face. Yes, so no, I was. Just, I was walking through. I was walking through the thing like with the George <laughs> Jefferson. Thing. I, I, I didn't have no worries. In the it world. was a lot of I told you so. <laughs> uh, a lot of people at the stores, grocery stores. You know, older people uh, couldn't believe. I can't believe. I can't believe it. But I ain't gonna lie, a lot of a lot of niggas voted for uh voted for Trump. A lot of yeah. niggas voted for Trump, man. I and, and it was man. it was it's way more, more than yeah, it was way more uh black supporters that like you voted for Trump. Yeah, I voted for Trump. Why would I vote for Hillary? Like you know who the fuck the Clintons is and blah blah, and everybody got their conspiracies about the uh about the Clintons, especially amongst the black community. This is three strikes, black folks, <laughs> especially black folks. They really messed up with that, Rome. They really underestimated yeah. they because they thought, you know, the blacks just gonna come out regardless. I hope, I hope we pull what the what the Arabic community is pulling in places like where you are, man. When that <laughs> shit pops off, Rome, you know you're gonna have to be on the ground. <laughs> yep. Cause, yep. Cause the closer Martin. it gets, the Muslim community, they're gonna be out in the streets, like oh, saying, yeah. like abandoned buying so we you don't have to be out in the streets right there reporting so yeah, they, they never left the street man every everywhere every day is a protest out here in michigan yeah i'll feel you on that all right um so this is just the reaction video this is what margaret kimberly was responding to uh rome and we see nick in the background he might be joining in a few minutes let's just see it's an eight second video apparently they're excited that they've canceled democracy and uh you know refuse to give that uh the ability to pick up somebody in the primary to their voters they feel like that's a good thing and they're just saying four more years and you saw what margaret kimberly said to that now lady bunny says dems you recall how trump won in 2016 right dems ran an unpopular candidate joe biden Hillary Clinton, with an uninspiring campaign. Joe Biden, Hillary Clinton had terrible campaigns. Man. Cheated her primary opponent, i.e. Bernie Sanders. And this time you're talking about Marianne Williamson. You're talking about RFK Jr. Um, and then um, unelected superdelegates, which is going to happen now, a voting rights act, which stabs Greens, meaning they took the Greens off the ballot, My moving the first state to, to uh, South Carolina. Now, no primary, like, yeah, this is a lot. I didn't realize that. Lady Bunny gave us a list of all the things they've been doing. That is that is, that is a factual statement. Now, a couple of the candidates have responded, Rome. Um, here's one of them. This is Margaret Kimberly. I mean, sorry, uh, uh, Marianne Williamson. This is definitely not no Margaret Kimberly right here. But <laughs> Mary <laughs> yeah, this is Marianne Williamson. Don't get that Obviously. messed up. Yeah, let's make sure. Yeah, let me make sure I say that's right, right. But uh, Marianne Williamson says, well, you won't believe what Florida is doing now. Let me make this bigger before I start reading. You won't uh, believe what Florida is doing now. You have to jump through a lot of hoops to get on the ballot in states across the country. But Florida takes the cake. They won't even let you try. The Florida Secretary of State has decided to simply allow the Florida Democratic Party to decide who 
it wants to be on the ballot. The Democratic Party said, quote, we only want Joe Biden, please, end quote. This is absurd and unconstitutional display is exactly how an author authoritarian state works. People are told they can vote, but are informed by someone else who their options will be. The word of my fathers keep ringing in my ear, quote, beat the system, kids. Beat the system. <laughs> <laughs> your daddy, your daddy was a fool. But um, I, I'm gonna say this. Uh, she thinks she's writing a novel. That's no, <laughs> trying to isn't that the, isn't that the end you know of a novel? Don't you book. repeat shit? Don't you but, repeat shit at the end of a novel? It's so long, buddy. <laughs> so long. Like you know what I'm saying? Go ahead. <laughs> What's so crazy is I would expect uh, this shit from you know Republicans. Like damn. And you, you wonder why we call, you know, say your motherfuckers blue MAGA. God damn, y'all, y'all really worse than the MAGAs right now. Y'all are really worse than the MAGAs. Y'all, y'all are not trying to give y'all not even trying to give that illusion of choice that we had, you know, in 2012, 2000, you know, saying 16 or whatever it may be. We don't even have the illusion of choice anymore. You're gonna pay for that because <laughs> people are gonna be like, they already pissed off. Yeah, for sure. All right, uh, back to a couple of receipts. Um, that is Marianne Williamson. Then you had uh, Dr. Jill Stein, who's also running the Green Party. Just kind of quote tweet, and I'll say that. Uh, so here's a reaction from another candidate, Dr. Jill Stein. The Democratic Party is openly rigging its primary in Florida. Another reason we need an actual Democratic Party, and we have Jay out in Florida. I love how we have members in like important like it, like areas important yeah. like cities to cover like you in, in in michigan to be able to cover the arabs and you got um the, the uh, what's happening with the, our arab brothers and sisters and then you got uh jb and florida and what's happening uh out there and then you you got uh nick in missouri it, it's it's great and then me and sabby um let's see any other reaction nina turner Ooh, right here yes. And like I said, I like Nina Turner. I do want to eventually get her on. I'll have a, I think I might have told Zoya to reach out. So if Nina Turner, if you're watching, Zoya will be reaching out to try to see if Nina, we can schedule if you're a you're watching, stop tomorrow. being a hypocrite and just go, go full, go super saying on the asses. If that's how you feel, because it's not just the party of Florida, it's the Democratic Party as a whole. And I'm telling you, I'm getting sick of you people leading my people back to the Democratic Party. We need real leaders. If you're going to call yourself a leader, lead them to something better. Lead them, you know what I'm saying, to a better group. It might not be as big as the Democratic Party. You might not have as, as much money and whatnot, but that's when you know it is yours, when you built it from the ground. If you're watching, stop being a hypocrite. Stop being a hypocrite. And be the leader that we all believe that you were before. That's what I got to say. You know, I ain't got no personal problems. We have talked before. But God damn it, this shit has to end. You know, like, let's get real here. <laughs> like this, we seen the end of democracy, right? The end of your illusion of choice, right? We seen it. It's our time to step up. That's all I got to say. Hey, let me read her talk. tweet. Um, Nina says a party that cancels primary elections cannot save nor protect um, democracy. And I'll speak on sort of like what you were saying. It feels um, like Nina Turner and since she's lost her last election and most more importantly, like in the last maybe six to nine months. Hang on a second here. Let me pause. Office. Okay, I had a little reminder. Come on, they had gave out a number. I needed to mute my thing. But anyway, um, it feels like Nina Turner has great analysis like this, and she goes up into a point. It's like she's right at the edge, looking over, like where we at. You know what I'm saying? Like, like she's right there, like reaching. It almost feels like she's reaching, going like this, but she still has her foot right on the ledge where the democratic parties can still like where she can still reach them. And I just wish she takes that jump. 
and fully because you're not going to get on like Israel's not going to like you. Apex not going to like you anytime you run it, it. Like literally, she can just say all the great things about Israel and they're still going to try to primary your ass. If you say anything pleasant or anything positive about the Palestinians. I, 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 just, seen, I, I just seen she got ratioed by a whole bunch of cultists, the Democratic Party cultists. It was thousands oh, of man. thousands of them on her head. And you know what I would have did? Fuck yeah, I made I, I helped Hillary Clinton lose that warmongering mother. Next time, y'all should listen to black women. We got the real power. Blah blah. I would have went. I would have went off. Like hell yeah, I made. I, I cost her election, and I cost Joe Biden his election too. If you don't listen to me, <laughs> what the hell, man? If all power is in our hands, and take advantage of that. They telling you 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 got enough power to. Like you're not even like you know, but you're not known enough to fuck up an election, especially with Hillary Clinton. Come on now, but if they want to, if they want to say we got that type of power, then fuck yeah, let's flex then, let's be about it. But all this back and forth with this party stuff is just is is a uh, exhausting <laughs> overall. All right, so the other candidate. Now I'm leading up to something that I'm going to be <laughs> announcing. If you haven't heard, I'm sure you haven't heard it, but others may not have heard it. Um, here is, and if you don't know, Jenk is actually running. Um, Democrats are right. Democracy is on the line in this election. We just didn't know. We just didn't know they meant they were going to try to end democracy themselves in the primary. <laughs> I don't understand why why you're talking <laughs> like this about people who are part of a team you want to join. Why not just not join that team? That's what I don't get. But he has another reaction here. The Florida Democrat. Um, let me uh let me zoom in a little bit better here for those that are watching on your phone, so you can see it a little bit better. The Florida Democrats have canceled their primaries as things stand now. They think they are going to award those delegates to Joe Biden. That's not going to happen. He just, I'm sorry, uh, he didn't win that election because it didn't happen. We all have just as much claim to those de delegates as he does. What the fuck are you going to do about it, though? Exactly. What the fuck are you going to do about it? you going to make a tweet? <laughs> oh, Boo-hoo. <laughs> y'all have y'all well, have no real power over this over the <laughs> what you gonna do about it? Everybody is complaining, and that's cool. Everybody has an opinion. That's cool. But just like assholes, everybody has one of those. But what the fuck are you gonna do about it? <laughs> <laughs> not, nothing. Not a damn thing. <laughs> And that's always you and I, I mean, a, a lot of radicals people's responses is that is it. You're telling me they did something wrong. So the next thing that should be coming out of your mouth is what are what are what is the repercussions that you're about to deliver? And that never comes out of your mouth. Progressive Democrat. That's 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 our our biggest critique. Up, Everybody guys, should like, be saying we should leave the Democratic Party. Anybody that's a Democrat and you don't agree with this in Florida, blah, 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 because I know there's millions of Democrats down there in Florida who do not agree with taking off, you know, people off the ballot or kicking people off the ballot. You know, I'm pretty sure some decent Democrats down there. Right. They should be leading the charge. Right. They they are the 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 head of the progressive. Right. The the talking points, the talking. uh, uh the, uh, the mouthpieces of the, Demo uh, of the Democratic Progressive Caucus, right? So they should be leading the people out of the fucking party in these primaries. They should be threatening the Democratic the Democratic Party to throw fair elections or they're going to take their people with them. It's so easy, even if you are fucking bluffing. I agree so much with that. What, what are you going to do? Because like, why would they listen to you if all Sunrise Movement do is after the Willow Project you double down for his support? Like what? Like what are you gonna do? You're you're not gonna go anywhere. You have to do what RBN, with Nick, with with Rome, with all of our you know Savvy JB. No more voting for you guys. That's it. We're just gonna service. yeah. We're just gonna extract our our vote from you. Um. Now let me let me continue with a couple of more. Uh. He went off. As you can see, this is the fourth, the third tweet I'm going to read of his on this one subject when he when he found this out. Florida Democrats, I'll, I'll read the first one at the top. Florida Democrats pulled the slimiest and dumbest political hack 
Hackett's job. They kept me, Marianne Williamson and Dean Phillips off the ballot, which then canceled the whole primary election. I guess they think Biden is, is that weak. It's tragic that this is normal for the Democratic Party. What's more tragic is that it's normal and you're just going to go along for the ride. Don't That's you know what's confusing me tragic. right now? Hmm. How the fuck is this nigga even running for president? Is that even That's legal? Another story. No. That's a whole nother story right there, Ron. It's a whole nother story. It's really just this is a clown show. It's really I, he I think book he's show, running. He? Yeah, it's a book. It's exactly. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, he, exactly. Yeah, he, and then he, in a and then in another story we're gonna cover, which is the 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 article that it says the squad, um, they're basically about to get destroyed. Um, Ryan, you seeing a bunch of articles about the squad, and then when you look at the article. Oh, Ryan Grimm has wrote a book. So Ryan Grimm has reached out to a bunch of friends and media to come up with these articles, and they all go back to his book. I started finding that shit out. It's pretty slimy. But anyway, that's a side story. Let's continue. Andrew Yang, Rome, even shouts this out. He says, the Democrats of Florida have decided that democracy doesn't apply in a Democratic primary for president blatantly corrupt let's let the voters speak that is uh, andrew yang weren't you gonna vote for him what's up nigga, he said the same shit during 2016 why do everybody have this goldfish memory like they said the shit look y'all votes are you know suggestion but in the back doors we got the super delicates we got all these other people who <laughs> that we really listen to you know isn't it funny cj we're almost popping Good What's, up, What's up, sir? Good to have our brother on back. Can't wait to drama to join us. But isn't it funny that all these progressives in December 2023 just now realized the Democratic Party primary was rigged? <laughs> <laughs> we said this at the beginning of the Marianne Wilson campaign, didn't we? Yes. Where we said, why are we wasting time? I asked her directly, why would why should people donate to her? Like, this is the question we ask all Marianne Wilson supporters. Why would anyone put for her? Why would anyone waste the resources of the working class advocating for someone who's running in a rigged primary? These people will turn around and flip it on us. Wasn't it crazy how they'll flip it on us? They, you were like Crystal Ball, that one of the dumbest people in the world. Oh, shit. Here go this nigga mansplaining again. What's up, Nick? What you got to say? <laughs> you got Crystal Ball that was like, if you advocate for third parties, you need to grow up. Remember that? <laughs> yeah, grow up. You got to support the candidate that has the most chance to win. That's what she said. Didn't she? That's what she said. And, That's what she my said. Response, remember, remember my response was? I was like, oh, Crystal Ball, you sweet summer child. <laughs> you, you sweet summer child. You have a better chance as a third party than you do as a progressive running in the Democratic Party because at least if you're a third party, you're in the general election till the end. Right. Who got more who got more vote? Who got more votes? Jill Stein or Bernie Sanders? Ooh. In the general Ooh. election, Jill Stein. Who got who got more votes? Holly Hawkins. Larry Ooh. Johnson, the Libertarian. The third party. Inherently, at least you stay in the fight. At least you stay in the fight. So now these people now they want to they 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 cycling their fans and their audience through a storyline, right? So now this is the part where like, oh no, my God, I can't believe the Democratic Party would do this. Then they're gonna tell the people to vote lesser two evil again. Then next election gonna come and they say, why don't we run this progressive? And then we're gonna be there like, oh my God, you guys waste your time in primary rig. And then they're gonna be like, oh my God, you guys are nihilist. Do you guys know that Jank Uger recently was like, yeah, the, the, the primaries against Bernie wasn't rigged. Like, he walked what? that back. Yeah, that was something I saw. I, I, mean, I thought maybe was, was it due distance? Well, someone was covering it where Jank was like, yeah, you got to come to terms that the primary wasn't rigged against Bernie Sanders. He even, he even said that. And now, they, now they're going through this new arc with Marianne Wilson. And now they're pretending uh, they just now realize the party rigged their primaries. But uh, go ahead, CJ. I'll pass it back to you. Yeah, so it, so it leads all the way up to this. So basically the storyline, I like how you rephrased it, rephrased it that way, Nick, is that primaries are rigged. It's funny how Jank 
uh, jimmies his way into running, even though he knows he can't run, happens to be happens to be writing a book. <laughs> ha- th- 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 don't think that's not connected. Him. What a coincidence. Then got team, yeah, then you got It's just so happy a coincidence that everyone who is interested in running for public o- office just so happens to have a book coming out. Isn't that weird? <laughs> and it always works. <laughs> what, yeah. what is uh, we need to do a study between the link between someone who enjoys writing and their will to join public <laughs> office? What's up with that link and that correlation there? It's a lot but, of money to watch there, man. You know, the campaign <laughs> phones you, get, get a little dirty. I'm you gotta watch that guys, money. Thank you, Janice. You it was guys, Kit from, I, want, I want to give a shout out to our friend Kit because okay. it was Kit. Yeah, it was them. Kit from Harlan's media covered it. I couldn't believe it. I don't know if Jenk was ever on the Democrats rigged the primary thing, but I thought Bernie bros did. I, mean, I thought Bernie Sanders supporters in general supported that, but he like fervently came out like, you guys got to stop saying the primary was rigged, that kind of shit. Anyway, now they come now saying, oh my God, the primary is rigged. But sorry, CJ, I apologize for interrupting. Go ahead, pass it to you. No, no, no. Um, No worries. Um, So I, I'm going to come and with sort of a quote unquote conspiracy sort of angle here. You have these people who all have some sort of angle running, not and that angle is not I'm running because I want to help workers and the people. That's not their angle. And yeah. they're being they're the victims, right? So it's like come one, come all. If you're a disaffected person who may not be voting for Joe Biden because you're disaffected, let us be some of those bait to catch you. Come watch this shit. Yeah, stay with us. We're we're the ones that's trying to run, and they're gonna eventually gonna be at the trap door at the end. Okay, guys, thank you for the ride. Now it's time to vote for Joe Biden. Do you <laughs> think this is a net to catch those catch those people? Do you think all of this sort of thing now to this build up to this Democratic presidential debate, which is tomorrow? I'm wondering. I might cover this, Nick. It might be that entertaining. The three of them. We got a new Republican. What, what debate is what's going on? Wait, what 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 debate going on? Oh, I'm sorry, you haven't seen this, so this is great no. news for you. Yeah, I'm, I'm, like, I'm on like, wait, TYT, what? T. I'm sorry, I thought you saw this on T Y T. They're gonna be having the three people who are being denied, you know, <laughs> access to the the three people that's running oh, in the Democratic par, uh, primary, other than Joe Biden, coming together on T Y T to do this debate. It's a conversation between losers. Response. Yeah. They call it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, I can. Let me. Yeah, let me read it, though. It says, and this is from the damage report. It says the establishment wants them silent. So we're giving them a megaphone. TYT is giving <laughs> the mic to all three Democratic presidential candidates, Marianne Williamson, Jank, and Dean Phillips, to respond. Oh, 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 so it's oh, not even sorry, a debate. Yeah. Sorry, CJ, but boo, I thought there was at first I thought there was a was a debate I with did too. RFK Jr., Cornell West. This good a Democrat between Marianne Wilson, Jenky, or what are they gonna debate? Who got the the worst Trump arrangement syndrome? The fuck? Sorry, go ahead, CJ. Yeah. That's pretty terrible. But uh, oh, we man, we do have terrible. our guest here. Let's let's wind this one down. Um because yeah, our CJ. guest has arrived, but the point being, I mean, we're, we're at the last slide anyway, uh, Nick, but the point being, I thought this was a debate. I didn't, for whatever reason, I just, I guess I just glanced at it and didn't read the details because I just assume it's, but it does say Democratic presidential debate response. And it's a response so to the GOP to, debate. Uh, so they respond to the GOP. What? So it's going to be, right. a tr- it's going to be Trump derangement syndrome hour. Right. Wow. Like what? What are they gonna do? Talking about who who supported Ukraine the most? <laughs> who has the most Putin derangement syndrome? Just just ridiculous. I, I, but, I, I um, would have been interested. My ner- my political nerdiness, for lack of a better term, I would have been interested if if you threw RFK Jr. and Dr. Cornel West in there because it becomes chaotic. <laughs> it become mostly because RFK Jr. more than uh, uh, I wonder anyone what. Else. I- they could arrange that. I wonder if they could arrange that. If, since they're not debating, I would Dr. assume Dr. Dr. Cornel West. Dr. Cornel West said he he's down to debate on on our channel, uh, RFK Junior. But RFK Junior. He don't want those hands. Uh, no, I don't know why all. they haven't been doing anything like that. Like, it made no sense considering the media blackout, right? But go ahead, CJ. 
Yeah, so um, it is now time, the top of the hour, and we have a very uh, special guest, um, someone that we always, or at least I always describe as, uh, we consider him an elder along with uh, people like Margaret Kimberly. Yeah, um, we just had Margaret Kimberly on, now we got a job. Yeah, so it's feeling back really good back having bang. these great back guests back back on. Back. And shout out to Zoya, who is the one that's doing the work that to get our, our get us more guests um, on the show because people do want to see us uh, talk to more people, Nick. So it's great to do that. Um, Zoya, and um, Zoya, Zoya. yeah, so shout out to Zoya. So I do want to bring on our very special guest. We consider him an elder, like I said, and we got a lot of different topics to talk about tonight. But here is Ajamu Baraka. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing well. Glad to be back uh, with you all once again. Absolutely. How you doing, Jamu? Good to have you back on. Good to have you back on. <laughs> um, there's a lot that I, I do want to kind of talk to you about. Um, this, this one topic that I do want to start with um, is something that is kind of hot uh, on the press right now. It's kind of It's kind of what's being... Um, uh, where is it at? Hang on one second here. Okay, right here. Um, it's kind of like what, uh, oh shoot, it blacked out. Let me restart this. My apologies. All right, so here it goes. Um, Donald Trump, there is a fever pitch, um, sort of, uh, ringing of the hands about Donald Trump. And I want to talk to you about it. Let's bring it up right now. Here it goes. And let's go to... My apologies. I had to start over here. Couldn't find it. That's my daughter's stuff. One second here. Damn. Oh, here it goes. All right, so... um. Morning Joe had uh, this guest on. I believe her name is uh, Applebaum. Is her is her last name? She wrote a piece. Oh, and Applebaum, and, Jesus Christ, yeah, and Applebaum. Yeah, my apologies. Yeah, and Applebaum. She wrote this uh, piece. Well, the I believe in the New York Times. This morning's New York Times. In the New York Times, um, about uh, uh, Donald Trump, and this segment is. The politics of fear, uh, Ajamu, and we're seeing it being turned up a lot right now. And I'm, I'm, I'm perceiving it, or I'm taking it to be that because they're seeing um, the poll, the polling for Joe Biden kind of, kind of receding, and the the uh, polling for Donald Trump sort of going up. Um, some key groups in the coalition for for Joe Biden and the Black uh, uh, coalition, young voters, they're seeing a lot of. A receding, so it seems like there's been some things that to trigger an uptick in this sort of uh, propaganda of fear, and this is one of the bigger ones I would say that I saw that I I just wanted to get your reaction to, and also Nick and Rome when once Rome starts. This morning, how a second term could unleash a darker Trump, highlighting the former president's violent and authoritarian rhetoric on the 2024 campaign trail. The paper notes that as he runs for president again, facing four criminal prosecutions, Mr. Trump may seem more angry, desperate, and dangerous to American-style democracy than in his first term. But the through line that emerges is far more long running. He has glorified political violence and spoken admiringly of autocrats for decades. The Times points to an interview from more than three decades ago where Trump spoke admirably of how China crushed Democratic protesters in Tiananmen Square and also highlights his past praise for. That didn't happen, by the way. Saddam Hussein and Philippine strongman Rodrigo Duarte. Duarte. The paper notice, notes that in a hypothetical second Trump administration, the forces that somewhat contained his autocratic tendencies in his first term, including some staffers, congressional Republicans, and a par partisan balance on the Supreme Court, would all be weaker. As a result, Mr. Trump's and his advisors' more extreme policy plans and ideas for a second term 
would have a greater prospect of becoming a reality. Let's bring in right now staff writer for The Atlantic, Ann Applebaum, her new piece, part of The Atlantic special issue outlining the dangers of a potential second term for Donald mm -hmm. Trump is titled Trump Will Abandon NATO. And I'll pause it here because... This is where, when I was watching this, uh, Ajamu, Nick, and, and Rome, this is where it, it became bizarre to me. Because, you know, you normally you're watching uh, Morning Joe, <laughs> uh, uh, and you're expecting bad stuff for them to say, to use against Donald Trump. And considering the reaction to the what's happening in Israel, sort of the reaction to now polling about Ukraine, I'm not understanding the use of saying Trump would abandon NATO as a way of saying we should make sure to not to put him into office. But can you speak, Ajamu, to have you seen, this seems like I've, I've never experienced this, this level of like uh, insider, like establishment uh, propaganda, the charges, uh, the constant coverage of him. Is it a fear that he's really going to remove themselves from NATO? Is it a fear that it's a different approach of, on these wars? Or what do you? what is your take on uh, of the sort of attacks on, on, on Trump? Well, look, I mean, I saw it in 2016 when Jill and I ran um, in, that, in that election. I mean, they had propped up, they had created a Donald Trump. We keep that in mind, folks, that basically... Donald Trump was the candidate that the Democrats most wanted to run against. In their arrogance, they believed that he would be the easiest candidate to run, run against. They completely misread the mood of the country, the consequences and impact of, of 40 years of neoliberal policies. And they kind of uh, revoked that uh, the electorate was, was, in, was prepared to engage in. Uh, and they created Donald Trump uh, but to their uh, ultimate surprise, Donald Trump ended up pulling the thing out. Their, their, their rhetoric uh, during the campaign, though, was one in which they tried to paint Donald Trump as the as the the opposite uh, of liberal values. It's very similar to the tone of that of that article of that somehow they represented uh, enlightened uh, liberal values, the highest expressions of of U.S. values and and civilization uh, and that Donald Trump and by extension his supporters and potential supporters uh, were the 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 aberrations they were the they were the uh, uh the 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 deplorable and concern about those specific policies because remember now when we talk about this whole Trump um Joe Biden struggle and we, we 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 when people reduce this to these individuals we we undermine and obscure and mystify if you will the class interests that are really in play donald trump represents the the aspirations of the petty uh, bourgeoisie the national and petty bourgeoisie primarily based in the u.s these are nationalists in uh, a more traditional sense, if you, if you will. Okay. The hegemony of the internationalist bourgeoisie, the monopolists that have been making uh, policies, controlling the state uh, for the last 40 years. We also need to remember this. We talk about this the, the hegemony of the neoliberals. Let's remember <laughs> that at what point in history did neoliberalism emerge? And what was the, the instrument that was used to, to advance neoliberalism and neoliberal globalization? The 1980s. What was the instrument? The Republican Party. This was part of the counter-revolutionary process that, that, that emerged in the 1970s. But how did, ne how did so but when we associate neoliberalism today what party do we associate that with? The Democrats. So neoliberalism has migrated into the Democrat Party. Part of that, that process of migration uh, occurred and was consolidated uh, in 2016. 
when Donald Trump uh, uh, surprised all of them and why. All of the remaining neoliberals in the Republican Party uh, shifted over to the Democrat Party. Okay, They were already in the Democrat Party also, but there was a political shift that took place. Mm -hmm. What are the interests? These are the monopolists. These are the internationalists. They have no loyalty to any particular nation. Their only loyalty is to making profit. And that is one of the talking points that the nationalists use, the Trumpians, if you will, uh, in their oppositional politics. People, re people refer to that as some of the more traditional kind of fascistic appeals. And to a certain extent, it is. But the real fascists, from the point of view of some of us, the driving force of fascism in the United States of America is not coming from the Trump forces who, uh, on the national level at least, are not in power. They don't control the state. But the neoliberal bourgeoisie that controls the national state, they are the, they are the authoritarians. They are the ones imposing a state, uh, if you will, a state line when it comes to all of these issues from Palestine, Ukraine, you name it, okay? <clears throat> and the alignment that they have made, the political alignment, political and ideological alignment they made with the controllers of, of information in the U.S., big tech, the media companies, basically they have been able to impose a particular kind of perspective and values that they don't want to see in any way challenged. And the only challenger they have out there, they see, is Donald Trump and the Trumpians, okay? So now with the, the real possibility of having to deal with a Donald Trump again, and let's keep in mind, folks, they will deal with Donald Trump. They will compromise with Donald Trump, okay? They did it before. When they were prepared, to, they had accepted in early 2020 that there was going to be a second, a second term of Donald Trump. It wasn't until the summer of 2020 that they realized, oh, wait a minute, he's vulnerable. We might be able to be able to get rid of him, you know, because there's already propping up a Joe Biden. But, you know, right now they want to in ensure that there's no challenge to their hegemonic politics. Now, that's why we've been exposed to this, this fear mongering again. But for us, for many of us, the real threat. Uh, to uh, to the to the working class in this country uh, and to global humanity emanates not from the Trumpian forces, but from these fascist neoliberals that control the national state. That's why I have fun. <clears throat> I have fun with uh, talking to like Trump supporters and conservatives. That's why I love that you call neoliberals because I'm like, bro, you're a liberal. <laughs> like, you guys are neoliberals. <laughs> if you're a Trump supporter. You should be 100% okay with everything what Joe Biden's doing. He expanded ICE. He deported more people than Donald Trump. Funded Israel more than Donald Trump. Funded the police more than Trump. Funded the military. Where's the, the difference between you guys? You notice how they got to make up these culture warriors, the culture wars to accommodate for that. Yeah. You have Joe Biden pretending to take, take positions that you know he don't fucking believe in. Like You have Joe Biden, his old boomer ass. Catholic, conservative, socially conservative over here. He do he giving speeches talking about yeah, we gotta stand for the LGBTQ. He don't know what the fuck he's talking about. <laughs> they tell him to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I, see that. I know you want to get ready for okay. Yeah, Rome, uh, you want to come so, in? Oh yeah, Rome, if you have if you have no, no, he 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 she hit it on the head. I ain't okay, really much okay. say shit. Um, now they, they kind of go more in depth and they bring on this former uh, uh, military industrial complex person. I don't want to say his name. You'll know exactly who it is when you see it to talk about what would be the effects of leaving NATO. And this is the selling point on why we uh, 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 Donald Trump is dangerous. Us now to take this a little bit further is former secretary of defense. And former oh, let me let me say, because Nick called this, he's like. This election cycle is going to be so weird because the Democratic Party are going to be the ones saying that if we elect Republicans, we're not going to be able to go to war. And that's yeah. essentially what they're saying, the argument in this, uh, in this way. Teacher, I don't want to ruin your, your presentation. No, no go ahead if you have something no, else. No, 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 no. Listen, listen. listen. If, if we ever get a chance, we need to listen to that Ant and Apple Bottom segment when they talk about NATO. Once again, I don't want to ruin your flow because I know you got something planned. Because I actually listen oh, it's to coming. that segment. And and it's Apple coming. Bottom puts on a vintage and Apple Bottom performance. Just put to put it lightly. But go ahead, see, I don't want 
I'll pass it back to you. I just want to let yeah, you know. I'll, I'll, I, uh, I do have that prep to play, so yeah, go ahead, you can actually play that and get the reaction. So let's listen to this. It's about uh, the first two minutes is when uh, uh, before we uh, uh, pause and discuss. I think it's now to take this a little bit further is former Secretary of Defense and former Secretary of the Army, Mark Esper. Um, Mr. Secretary, thank you for being with us. Let's talk about what would happen with NATO. Where does Donald Trump stand on NATO? And what would that mean for the U.S.? Well, first of all, good to be with you uh, this afternoon, Katie. Um, look, with regard to NATO and, and having lived through this with him, uh, I think one of the first things that would happen is he would withdraw support for Ukraine. And, uh, of course, if that were to happen, I think the, the whole effort to support Ukraine in its war against Russia would, would eventually crumble because— Are you trying you know, to help him win? I'm, I'm sorry, because we already, <laughs> we already got the memo that the—what uh, was it? The Pentagon said that they was going to run out of money by the end of the year yeah. for Ukraine. Yeah, so, heard that too. yeah, these are these are things we already know. You can't scare me with, oh, there's going to be less death. The fuck? Okay, give us, give us a fuck. <laughs> exactly, it's crazy. Yeah, and oh, actually, let me let it play a little more because he's he's gonna say something pretty shocking. It's kind of like a big block in the Jenga tower. You pull us out, and everything else collapses. But I think his next move would be to uh, to begin pulling us out of NATO. Certainly, troops out of NATO countries. Um, and uh, and eventually that could cause the collapse Based. of the alliance. And that's exactly what Vladimir Putin would love to see, right? It, is that for because... one of our <laughs> Go ahead, Nick. Go ahead. For one, that's based, and I want to get a drama in here soon. But <laughs> are you for one? Are you trying to help him help Trump win? <laughs> for one, two, I don't believe this shit to be honest. And I I will be either proven right or wrong with time. You know what I mean? And I will admit if I'm wrong. But my instinct, I've been telling you this for like over a year, right, CJ? My instinct is that Trump is going to do none of this shit you've been talking about. I promise mm -hmm. you, if Trump wins, he's going to find a way to twist NATO to a good thing. He's like, we got to, I'm, well, I'm going to do, I'm going to reform NATO and turn NATO to an American first uh, institution. I promise you, if he says that, his audience is going to eat it up. <laughs> but anyway, sorry. Look, uh, CJ, go let, ahead. Let's remember. No, go ahead. Let's remember under Donald Trump is when the U.S. policy began to whip NATO into shape. Donald yeah, Trump yes. is the one that, that was pushing them or forcing them to meet their 2% of defense spending toward, toward NATO. And he was in, and the uh, military defense uh, 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 establishment, they were, they were ecstatic. They loved it because we all know that's a lateral transfer of money from the pockets of the U.S. population right. straight into the defense industry. So they love Donald Trump on that. Look, these people are not concerned about, about NATO in that sense. They are concerned about a uh, continued support for the proxy war in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, but they, it, 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 look, it, as Nick just said, I don't think that, that, look, there is a trajectory, there is a a, a momentum uh, when it comes to bourgeois politics that even Donald Trump is not going to disrupt, that basically uh, he will be a little less controllable uh, in a second term, but Donald Trump is still going to advance policies that in the end uh, will advance uh, U.S. interests and the, the interests of the bourgeoisie. Look, the supporters of Donald Trump, what they really want in, they want in, they want in on, on the racket. They want in on the hustle, okay? Yep, exactly. When Donald Trump imposed the sanctions against China, it was it was for what? To basically force the Chinese into, they were going to try to bluff and extort the Chinese into expanding their purchases of, of, of products uh, from the base of supporters, they're, they're support and they love, they may have to make some concessions if Donald Trump wins, but it won't be a, a, a some kind of fundamental break uh, with bourgeois politics, but they are concerned, just like they were, they were pissed when Donald Trump uh, blew, uh, blew the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, uh, mm. uh, Agreement, because for them, not, not only did they want to have that Trans-Pacific Partnership, that was the first leg of imposing then on the Europeans the Trans-Atlantic Investment Partnership. And when the TPP was, was, was blown apart, that meant there was no momentum for the Trans-Atlantic Partnership. And as a consequence, I would make the argument, uh, maybe not here at this point, I just make this comment. What we're seeing now with the Russian uh, proxy war is uh, another example of 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 war being politics in in, a, in another form. 
that basically as a consequence of that uh, being able to consolidate uh, Euro U.S. hegemony in Europe through that trade agreement, they are doing it and have done it uh, through a war policy uh, uh, with with through through Ukraine. Absolutely. All right. Let's I, I, let's I just listen. Find it funny how you know all these they're trying to scare us with things that Trump didn't even do when he had the chance to do it, and they've been threatening us with these things for for eight years now. Like, come on now, like. If, if he wanted to get rid of NATO and all that, he had more than enough time to do it. So don't tell me, oh, this is the time he's going to do it because he's going to, man, get the fuck out of here. I ain't believing that shit. I believe I, when, it I, when I see it, you know, but he's going to try to put fear in my heart from oh, Trump breaking up NATO. Good. What the fuck? <laughs> you know, who, do you know who you're talking to? But at the same time, do you know who you're talking to? Because I'm not a fucking fool. That's just like. Everybody was telling us Trump is going to touch bars. He's going to touch uh, jail bars. And I said, do you really want to open up that can of worms? Because then old ass Carter going to get locked up. Bush going to get locked up. Obama going to get locked up. That's a that's a can of worms that you can't even put the lid back on. Word. You don't want to you don't want to take it there. What they're going to make it look like is these rich people. Uh, they gave they gave you illusion of rich people and powerful people being held accountable. But. Is he behind bars or is he giving an interview right here? All right, then. <laughs> is um, is the collapse of uh, of NATO. So, and then the next look would be, does he start looking, as he would discuss with me and others at the time, does he look to pull troops out of Korea, out of Japan, and out of other countries who are allied with us? So, look, it's, it's quite disconcerting from a national security standpoint. What does it mean for the U.S. if we're out of NATO and we're no longer a, a part of a system that offers protection in return for our protection? Well, first and foremost, those regions of the world are less secure. So you'd have the Baltic states, the Poland, Poland, Romania, other frontline states vulnerable to Russian aggression. Uh, you would see the same in Asia in different ways from the uh, Chinese Communist Party. And eventually, of course, that all ripples back to us. The United States would be less secure as well. And I would think you know, it would, it would be a retreat from the global stage after 75 years of leadership around the world since the end of World War II that America would withdraw. And uh, I, I think when that happens, you would see the international uh, rules and norms that have been built up since that time uh, eventually uh, fade away and crumble as well. So, I, look, it would be a very bad situation. I won't say as far as dystopian, but you would see so much of what we've come to know and experience, so much of the global order, the rules, the regulations, the norms that have made us all. You, you hear him keep saying the global order, the glo like. Like the supremacy. Is, is this a real fear? <laughs> I, I, like I know that's kind of like what we're talking about, but this is what I've been. I'm going to bring the video back up. Is like, is it a real fear that they believe if Trump is there? Because think about how many wars we're in. If Trump is there, is it going to alter our plans with China? Is it going to alter our plans in Ukraine, like Ajamu was just uh, uh, speaking about? Is it going to alter our plans for what, you know, said country, just insert how many countries that we want to be in conflict with? So is that a real fear? Not because he's anti-war, but because he's just, he's not a warmonger in the same mold as they are a warmonger. It's kind of unconventional in a sense, like, like when, how he got them to, to uh, uh, meet their their two percent uh, goal uh, uh, for NATO, he, it was because it was a public thing. He said all this stuff. They need to pay up their money. He was saying all these things that they don't normally do to get these countries on board. So, Ajamu, could you speak to any part of that or, or anything that resonates with you? Look, the the the, comp, the issue they have with Trump is only strategic. It's strategic uh, strategic differences. Uh, Donald Trump. Uh, one of his successes, in my opinion, and if, from the point of view of the bourgeoisie, was that Donald Trump had a strategy. He had, he had, he had a, 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 a belief that uh, there was a possibility of splitting off Russia from China and that uh, Russia should be brought back into the European family and that um, the main target, the main enemy for U.S. hegemony was, in fact, China. Now, there were many elements in the foreign policy community that didn't completely agree with that. But by the time Donald Trump left office, there had been uh, a consensus built within the foreign policy community that, in fact, 
the main uh, 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 threat was coming from China. So he, in fact, consolidated the, the anti-China line, a line that, that, that was first created and advanced under the Obama-Biden administration. So what, what's going to happen if Donald Trump wins again is that the target will, in fact, continue to be uh, China with the real possibility of some kind of, 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 of conflict around the issue of Taiwan. Uh, the difference this time, though, is that the Russians have understood that there's no cooperation with the with the West. Uh, and so if they were naive, and I think they were to a certain extent, that naivete has been completely destroyed. Uh, and so the balance of forces have shifted against the U.S. But make no mistake about this. Uh, all of the elements in the bourgeoisie are still committed to uh, global mm -hmm. hegemony. The only question is, yeah. how do you arrive at it? How do you maintain it? Yeah, so Absolutely. there's a lot Go of ahead, great man. things said there. Um, and as I mentioned before, we know that Trump is not anti-imperial. He wants no. U.S. imperial domination. Uh, imperial domination. The current neoliberal regime don't like how Trump is going about that. And I'm going to give you guys another example. One of the things that Donald Trump did as president that was actually a positive change was his rhetoric around North Korea, the DPRK. <laughs> and the neoliberal establishment, while pretending that Trump was a maniac, was attacking Trump for doing the one thing that is actually pro-peace. They was like, Trump is dangerous because he's talking to North Korea and he doesn't want to wage war with them like the psychopaths in the Democratic Party. Are you trying to make it look good or bad here? Now, this is what I'm talking about here. Uh, just to be real quick. One, the only good thing Trump did would try to uh, normalize relations with the DPRK, with North Korea. Trump steps into North Korea and agrees with Kim Jong-un to res resume talks. Now, I remember at the time, fam, if you saw the Morning Joe segments around this time, <laughs> bruh, CJ, Boy, Joe Scarborough was blowing a gasket every damn show about this. <laughs> this is why Trump is the worst. He get he friends with tyrants and dictators. Why is he being friends with Kim Jong Un? This is why Trump is the worst. The one good thing Trump did, they they turn it into a negative. Meanwhile, on the other hand, you had Kamala Harris on the campaign trail, essentially pro saying stuff that will lead to war, promising war with North Korea. You had Hillary Clinton on the leader of Trump, which is why I still say to this day we dodged a bullet, because Hillary Clinton said that we're going to have a more muscular foreign policy than Donald Trump. One of them including increasing sanction, sanctions on North Korea and increasing tensions with North Korea. Biden shared the same worldview, which led North Korea to saying this. Why North Korea called Joe Biden an imbecile <laughs> and a low and a fool with low IQ. IQ. And this is what North Korea say about all the Democrat leaders recently, because all the Democrat leaders have been way more unhinged on this issue than the MAGA right. I say the MAGA right because the John McCain right have been on the same page on, uh, as well. So that's my take on this. Uh, it's important to remember that Trump is pro-imperial, pro-empire, but he does stuff like that, like normalizing relationship with North Korea, that the establishment cannot, they will never tolerate that. Well, go ahead, CJ. I'll pass it back to you. The U.S. do not yeah, well, want beef with, with, with the DPRK. They do not want problems with the DPRK. This is one of the reasons why we haven't went and invaded their shit and did what we do to other motherfuckers because they have nukes and their leader isn't afraid. And he has shown time and time again. He has told us time and time again, try me. Like, <laughs> like he, like, try me. And I feel him because you're not about to take me out like how you did Libya. I'm not about to become a victim. Of the West, my people are not about to become a victim of the West, just like how the uh, uh, the South is. So yeah, yeah. Try me. And <laughs> and to wrong point, I'll be real brief. And I pass back to CJ. Kim Jong Il in the DPR regime has done a fantastic job at brunting Western imperial aggression. Right? Do you guys remember when the West made a deal with Gaddafi so Gaddafi can denuclearize, and then the U.S. came in and fucked Gaddafi up? So the DPRK, Kim Jong-il and their dynasty, they saw that. 
And it was like, yeah, we're not going to denuclearize because if we do, if they did, there would have been regime change 10 years ago, 15 years ago. So that was a great move. And they pretend that the that the DPRK nation is militaristic because they got nukes. But no, that's the only reason why they are still a country. But anyway, CJ, you can continue. I can go on. I go on DPRK uh, spill all day. But go ahead, CJ. Yeah, just a little more from this uh, segment, and then we can move on to the Rashida Tlaib uh, part and the Dana uh, Bash uh, interview. But um, just a little bit on this. This is back to the Morning Joe. And Ajamu, we always describe Morning Joe. We do a lot of propaganda report analysis of Morning Joe because we feel like Morning Joe is the is the donors show, is the show that the establishment watches for instructions or insight this is why look at who they, they got a on lot of hey, yeah high level people that come on here you're talking about the highest level reporters like the david ignatius and i swear richard haas is some sort of intelligence because he's always there p- at pivotal points and they bring in a lot of special people and and um apple bomb here is one of them let's listen to what she says about her article and uh, a second trump term a second term I think people are suddenly realizing that Trump is very likely to be the Republican candidate. And I think they're also realizing just about now that he is running on an explicitly anti-constitutional platform. Uh, He's running as someone who would overthrow the Constitution, who would undermine it, who would, uh, you know, undermine the American civil service, maybe the military. Like, like I hear you or somebody laughing. And the reason is, is because this is this is. This is a point that only will hit what like a patriotic white person like (laughs) constitution who can like nobody else like this is not a selling point for anyone outside of that sort of uh, (laughs) that group. But uh, let's get back to it. Terry. And I think that's why you're suddenly seeing so many people writing about it. Um, in fact, you know, your your previous item, we're already having a taste of what a Trump second term could look like in this battle, really irresponsible battle over funding for Ukraine. You know, here is an ally who we've been supporting bravely for the last you know 19 months. They're not an ally. Um, they are fighting. <laughs> not on the a member ground. of NATO. They are, you know, under. So she said, they're an ally. No, they're not. Ukraine is not an ally. They're not a member of NATO. They are we'll a tool. <laughs> Mining the army of one of our important geopolitical rivals, Russia. And we're, you know, arguing in Washington about whether or not to keep helping them. I mean, that's outrageous, but it's a, it's a taste of what could happen uh, if Trump were to win, in which case he's very likely to say, I don't care about Europe. I don't care about NATO. I'm leaving. So, so Anne, <laughs> as you studied uh, in, in in your book, as you studied what Orban did on the path to power, as you studied what the Law and Justice Party did on the path to power, I don't remember it even being as explicit. Right, their threats against democracy in Hungary and Poland, even being as explicit as having a presidential candidate promising to terminate the Constitution execute generals that are insufficiently loyal and ban television news networks that he doesn't like. Again, in the campaign phase, this seems far more explicit, far more extreme than even what we saw in Orban's rise and the law and uh, justice's rise in Poland. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's true that in both of those cases, It was the second term. It was the second time of being in power when those political parties and leaders, you know, began to push back against the media, you know, change the Constitution, change the courts. And so in that sense, this is a parallel. But you're right that this kind of language about, um, you know, uh, attacking my enemies and um, describing them as vermin, you know, which is which is the kind of language that Nazis use to describe their enemies and describe Jews. you know, this isn't it, something it you heard. Oh, 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 now we want to talk like about. Like, oh, <laughs> now we want to talk about words that Nazis use when y'all sit here and let Israel call uh, these people <laughs> human animals and all kind of crap. It's disrespecting yeah. whole generations of people, and now you want to talk about rhetoric. That's funny. That's funny to me. 
That's funny. Well, go ahead, Nick. You were gonna chime in, sir. Yeah, she said that's you can't call people vermin. That's the level we will never accept that. That's what Idro's doing. Just call exactly. Palestinians. Yeah. With, with, with that, 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 US support. Yeah, and we can we can kind of wrap this uh particular segment up with uh with this. I just thought I thought thought it was very curious because you know we do news every day and the last two days they just turned up this whole second term and anytime you see all the newspapers do it all the cable news stories uh, uh, stations do it you know it's a coordinated sort of thing and i'm just curious the guy doesn't his policies are 99 percent aligned with them so what is it that is so egregious that they're having 91 charges they're having all this just just ridiculousness uh, 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 against him. And now a lot of it's warranted. It's just that it's warranted against a lot of other people too. And it, it makes him a martyr and it just making his, his, his polling go up. It's just like for whatever they're trying to do to not get him elected is having the opposite uh, effects. But uh, I'll give a John Moore final word on the topic of uh, the second Trump term. Um, you, you tweeted out before, um, black folks aren't afraid of a second uh, Trump term. Why, why did you have that sort of phrasing or, or that thinking behind? Or why aren't you afraid uh, of a second Trump term? Well, I'm not afraid because I'm a revolutionary. But I think that uh, when I tweeted that out, it was because uh, we knew that this fear mongering campaign was going to go into high gear. And that there were, in fact, some segments of the black community that would fall for it. Uh, that's the role of the black misleadership class is to echo the the talking points coming from from Massa. And so they we knew and we know that that is going to, in fact, happen. We have to remind our folks, though, that we have survived uh, a few hundred years in this settler colonial project. We have met. Uh, forces much more powerful than a Donald Trump. Most of the presidents uh, and administrations in this country have been opposed to the the objective human rights of African people in this country. And we have survived and we have to a certain extent thrived, if you will. So, you know, when you understand who you are, understand your history, you know that four years of Donald Trump uh, or four years of any of these pigs are not going to be enough to undermine our people. I'm more concerned with the possibility of a second Biden or Newsom uh, administration, mm. because when these Democrats are in power, it disarms and demobilizes mm. the masses of the people. And these neoliberals are fascists. They are more of a threat than the, the populist uh, threat coming from the Trumpian forces. Now, the Trumpian forces have some some there's some elements there that are very dangerous. No question about that. But mm-hmm. I argue again that these are not the forces that control the U.S. state. You know, you all talked about a few minutes ago what what you characterize as something good uh, when the uh, Trump administration uh, basically uh, de- demobilized, if you will, the U.S. state against North Korea. Uh, and once they had the agreements between the U.S. and North Korea, what did the Koreans do? They stopped doing the, the, the tests. They, they start, stopped the, doing the, uh, the mm-hmm. international b- ballistic tests. They chilled them out. And somebody said, uh, asked Trump, well, what happened? He said, because the threat, that, as they proceeded, was from us. And I told them, don't worry about us. That's simple. Okay? Now, that you said, like you said, the, the neoliberals freaked out because the neoliberal the neoliberal strategy is based on continued chaos yes. it's based on insecurity and fear therefore it, it it that's the basis of them being able to to suggest to their vassal states that they need us protection okay that's why the congress came in after he chilled out on north korea and passed uh, legislation blocking the possibility of, of Trump withdrawing forces from South Korea as though that was going to be some kind of irresponsible move. Well, if you committed to peace and and trying to bring about some kind of, of de-escalation, then why isn't the time to end the Korean War? 
why not begin a process of of, of bringing the truth uh, uh, from the U.S. from 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 the U.S. Uh, from South Korea, <laughs> you know? Yes. But this is this is their angle. This is their agenda. It is perpetual war. That is the basis of full spectrum dominance. Okay, they're concerned with the Trump forces because, as we said, he has a slightly different strategy. He's not a, a, a peace in it. I mean, you know, he he will. I mean, he 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 advocated for continued uh, illegal uh, occupation in Syria. He said, "Take the oil." Okay, he's a gangster, but yeah. and, and it was the gangsters like him that made the U.S. what it is. Okay, so you know, it, it's, it's these these slight differences that make that, that that some people are concerned with. But again, the big bourgeoisie they really not that concerned about Donald Trump. Okay. Now they're concerned about the possibility of, of, of de-escalation in Europe to a certain extent, because it's all about the money. This Ukrainian war resulted in what? It resulted in record profits yeah, by both the military money. industrial complex and the energy companies. It's about money. Okay. And then and they equip the US population to, into supporting this bullshit. So they want to continue with those kinds of policies. But the Trump enforcers say, look, you know. Y'all gotta let our people in. We our people gotta make some money too, you know? And, and that's what the hustle is all about. It's an intra bourgeois struggle. Yeah. Uh Romy, anything you want to add? And then I have a quick story that we do. And uh we have a share story because uh we I think you both you have planned to cover the anti-Semitism nonsense uh psyops. Yes, so we both, I have that, to that, cover that. that. It can kind of be a shared segment. We both have to plan for that. So I have a short segment, but before that, I'll pass it to Rome. Anything you want to add on, on this segment? Before yeah, I just, I just wanted to say, you know, all these talking heads when it comes to, you know, Morning Joe, CNN, Fox News, anybody who's seeming, well, not Fox News, but anybody who's seen mad, even us, we all benefit from Trump being in office. That is not a lie. All of them want Trump back in office because he sells. Look at the ratings from mainstream media from when Trump left office. That shit went straight to the fucking ground. They need him back. When Bernie Sanders was running, you remember this? Bernie Sanders was running. He was doing a speech. They played his podium. Donald Trump empty podium. And they still made money off of that shit. We all benefit. All of us. You know how many, you know how many fucking videos Kyle Kalinsky and David Packman about to be doing on Donald Trump? They about to make hundreds of thousands just talking about some fucking bullshit. Hmm. They all benefit. We all do, and they gonna love it when he's back in. And then even if he was, Packman had a screen with like thirty five thousand live viewers talking about some DeSantis shit. Like, bro, these motherfuckers about to eat good with Trump coming back. Rome. They about to eat like, good with, with, with Trump back in office. It's not because everybody all pumped up. They pumped all this fear into you. Now you got Morning Joe yelling at you. Now you got mm. independent media yelling at you, pump, pumping all this fear into you. And now you're gonna run back. What's going on now? What the Trump say? What the Trump say? What the Trump do? And all you're gonna do is type in Trump, and you're gonna see him right there. You're gonna click <laughs> the video, and you're gonna give him some fucking money for the fucking time. Oh yes. We are gonna love it. I'm gonna love it when Trump back in office. Damn right. RBN need that motherfucking money. And we're gonna have all these fucking liberals. All these liberals, all these people them. trying to find themselves. <laughs> I don't know what to do with the come on, come over here. We got you. It's 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 never a slow news day at RBN. Whether <laughs> I said before, whether Trump wins, I'm gonna laugh. If Trump wins, I'm laughing at Biden. If Biden wins, I'm laughing at Trump again. Like when Trump lost to Biden, bro, I was clowning back on. I'm like, how you guys lose to Kamala Harris? You motherfuckers lost a general election to Kamala Harris. So I'm a clown whoever lose. So it never slow new days to me. But they can I, have I, I, but I predict this. There'll be no second Biden administration. Biden's mm -hmm. not going to run. Absolutely. Oh, oh. I feel that same way. I don't know how it's going to happen. I That part I haven't thought out yet, uh, Ajamu, but I have the same gut feeling that... It, it, like the numbers, the like they know he can't debate. Like, there's just how is this Even gonna happen? Do, well, like, follow oh. the money, follow the money. The donors don't have confidence that Biden can win. And they if they withdraw their money and they are talking about it, then wow. Biden is through. 
Biden has no existence outside of his donor base. Yeah. That's why they are now pushing Newsom. Newsom is 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 pursuing a strategy where he's not trying to necessarily differentiate himself from uh, Biden. He's embracing Biden, mm-hmm. but he's embracing Biden as the 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 counter to Biden, if you will. Okay. Right. No, it'll be it'll be Newsom. Yeah, a lot of people think that. I think I think that too. I mean, why else would they do a debate against Ron DeSantis, who at at one point people thought that he could be um, um, the nominee? But to Nick, to Rome's point, when those disaffected people come here, this is what the message we're going to give. And I'll pass to you, Nick, for the next segment. The message we're going to give is whether red or blue, whether Republican or not, what are we going to do, Nick? Nick is going to be in, in KC. He's still going to be having diaper runs. Doesn't matter. Joe Biden, Trump, doesn't matter. Rome's still going to be renovating the RBN library. Make sure you send in those revolutionary books, everybody. We'll get that address to you. I'm still going to be out here, different things. Uh, the uh, skid row I want to do, and, I, and it's a new thing that I haven't announced, but I want to do some diaper runs to some women's shelters out here. We'll be doing that. And then we have Sabby in Boston doing her thing. We got JB and Orlando doing their thing. It's, it's not going to change. The people, you're still getting paid the same amount, whether Biden or Trump. Is the same, you're getting the same, the same pay. It's the same police brutality that's happening, whether Biden or Trump. It's the same ice. So doesn't change. And, and we need to stop letting these people make us feel like it's going to be so different when it's really just this dictation or dictatorship of capital that's in all the time. That's who wins every yeah. election is the dictatorship one, of capital. Go ahead. Difference, and tell me. One difference in 2025, if Donald Trump does not, in fact, win, uh, the U.S. will begin the process of spinning apart. So can you can you detail that a little more, explain a little more about what you mean by that? The U.S. is an artificial nation. And basically, if Donald Trump is not allowed to run or if something, if if a controversy emerges again, he does not win, uh, you'll see a process of various states beginning to um, to withdraw from the union. Very similar to what happened in the U.S. uh, in the in the late uh, 1850s, except that this time there's no no national cohesion. And so you're going to see a process beginning beginning of the U.S. Uh, spinning apart as a nation state, in my opinion. Wow. That'll wow. be interesting. Too. That'll be dope I'm, as fuck. I'm, I'm Break this right motherfucker now. up. I didn't see that coming, <laughs> but I'm rooting for it. That would be interesting. What, what, is, what is your take on whether that is positive? I guess you can't see the future. I guess it would be what does it turn in? But what is your take on yeah. that happening? If that were to happen, what, what do you... Like, what do you see that being? A positive, a negative, a step back, a, a step towards revolution, a, a a forced revolution? Like, what do you, what do you see in that happening? Unfortunately, our forces are not going to be able to take full advantage of the chaos. It's going to be a very dangerous period because the, the fascistic tendencies will become even more pronounced, and for black folks, uh, it's going to be even more dangerous because as the country spins apart. And it'd be it'd be on the basis of regions also. Where are the majority of black folks? They're in the south. Wow. The south. Outside of the south, we're in nine major urban areas. Uh, these urban areas, if it starts spinning apart, are going to be killing zones. Okay. In the south, what do you have most of the uh, uh, military uh, infrastructure? Mm. Right, right there in the south. So basically, and where are we still a minority, even though we are a majority, our majority of our people are right. still are right. a minority in these various states. So it's going to be very, very dangerous because uh, the U.S. will be the last bastion of of, of bourgeois rule. Uh, and who knows how this is going to uh, to play out. But I just don't see any national cohesion because the, the legitimacy crisis the legitimation crisis is deepening. There is no commitment to something called the US, United States of America. That's why you have the mass killings. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I want to get your opinion on the mass genocidal psychosis that we've been seeing in our society. Um, 
if I were to say I'm thankful for one thing, it would be the fact that people see what I have been seeing out of Zionists for the last few years because Zionism is an ideology that has deeply disgusted me, and that's why it was one of my top litmus tests to the dismay of the progressive movement. I held Marianne Williamson's feet to the fire because Marianne Williamson used to say stuff like, Israel has the right to defend itself. And a bunch of dumb, dumb leftists and progressives didn't understand that why that was problematic until the current trend. Now they understand. Now when someone say Israel had the right to defend himself, they're like, oh, how dare you say that? Meanwhile, Marianne Williamson was just saying that all the time. I called it out, call it out, call her out. And the people was upset. People were like, oh, you guys are just implementing a parody test on people. People can't grow. Like I see if I was talking about a fucking 15, 16, you know what I'm saying? 20 years old. These motherfuckers old enough to be our granddaddies and grandma. I, I, no, 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 no. You stuck in your ways, but you know what pays. Because if that was the if that was the case, then you would have been about free Palestine. I remember it was somebody had tweeted something about tweet tweeted something to her about, you know. You know what's going on in Palestine. It was a couple years ago, and she was like, I, I don't subscribe to that way of thinking or some bullshit like that. Like, come on, man. It's a 50 something year old. I remember person. that, yeah. I remember that. So go ahead, Nick. I want to show you guys, I want I want to get a John with thoughts on this because uh this segment is gonna be about John Fetterman and John Fetterman's uh genocide denial, and the same people who thought that RBN was malicious actors mm. here to disrupt the progressive movement. Using purity tests as a weapon, I, I remember I, we had the dumbest critics. That was like what the Vanguard said. They were like they use purity tests to drag down the progressive movement. <laughs> I'm like, man, I had I, it, it feels good to have dumb critics, doesn't it? It feels like, good to a, have power a, like that. Shit. That's a good thing. <laughs> I you know what I mean? Like, not like they were saying, man, Nick is a right winger. He's in his position. No, they. Our criticism that we get is that we use too much purity tests on people that have power. Can you believe these people have morals? What you mean you don't want to fucking vote for my warmongering candidate? <laughs> and look, look, the oh, thing that the thing that they, they can't beat you all with is that you all approach these issues uh with 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 research. Your fact, you got your facts down, you got your arguments. You know, and that is what drives some of these these people crazy. If you're all just running running off at the mouth, they would have dismissed dismissed you a long time ago. But y'all come with the with y'all y'all shirt is tight, and that is problematic for folks, especially when they have to deal with with uh, with sharp Africans. You know, they, they, they don't have to deal with. If we was dumb, if we was dumb, they would promote us. Yeah. They, you see what they did when we was working for Bernie. These are the same people who 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 lift us up on the pedestal when we was. Working for Bernie Sanders, we was out there going door to door. Some of I us quitting our jobs, you, and those same people throwing down that motherfucking pedestal. As soon as you say, "Hold on, what the fuck? What you mean, vote for <laughs> Biden to save democracy? What democracy? Hold on, what you talking about, Bernie?" Then everybody looking at you like, "Rome, I can't believe that. I can't believe y'all shitting on Bernie Sanders with all that heat and blah blah blah." Like, no, nigga, we don't. You know what I'm saying? We don't. Uh, 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 Celebrate nobody. I don't see Bernie Sanders as a celebrity. He's supposed to be a mouthpiece for me. He's supposed to be my mouthpiece. I did not tell Bernie Sanders to go out there and say vote for Joe Biden. I did not tell that man to compromise. I did not tell that man to sell out his email list. And yeah, he did all of it. I didn't say that. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm pissed. They they supposed to work for you. That's how it's supposed to go. But you see, you Americans are so stupid and brainwashed. That you look at your politicians like celebrities now. So when they do something foul, when it when it finally gets to you, it breaks your fucking heart. And you just can't, well, I can't believe AOC would believe it, nigga. She a politician. What the fuck are you talking about? Yeah, I can't I can't believe the West, you know, sabotages campaign. <laughs> yeah. That's a shame, isn't it? That's a shame, isn't it? And uh on on Rome's last point before I get back on the segment. You guys don't know, man. I had so many of these Bernie people that was asking me to run, like after I was South Carolina. So many people. I didn't want to do it. I was like, what the fuck y'all talking about? But there was a there was after I left South Carolina, all the big Bernie people, Nina Turner, all of them in the campaign, they all followed me. And there was a big giant divorce. And I told you guys, I I, I spare you guys because I, I told the story many times. All these people, they also they blocked me and followed me. Now they pretend I don't exist. They used to promote me. 
like for example, like Status Quo, Jordan Jordan Ch- uh, Cheriton yeah. had me on this show talking about how all oh, the good work that Nick is doing on the Bernie campaign, and all of a sudden, as soon as I divorced from the Bernie movement, we called Jordan out for voting for Joe, Joe Biden. All of a sudden, our being deplorable, nigga, you just promoted me when I was on the Bernie campaign. <laughs> that, that just one example. It happened many times. I don't talk about it often. But there is a massive divorce bout that I love that came from the Bernie movement because apparently I weaponized litmus tests. One of them being Israel Palestine. I held our progressive leaders to a higher standard after Super Tuesday because I saw you guys fail. So I want to get your opinion on this before I go back to John Ferriman because he's a yeah, key because. part of the segment. But before I bring him up, I want to get John Moo's general thoughts on this mad genocidal psychosis that we've seen. Uh, because look at this. You had 700, 700 Palestinians that was killed in the last 24 hours after the humanitarian pause was lifted. Uh, one of the reasons why we called for ending the occupation because we knew it was going to happen. But look at this stat that kind of blew my mind. You know what I mean? That I pulled out, I'm like, what? Germany killed about 750 per day in Auschwitz. This is the Holocaust. Out, that's crazy. Out with 700 people, 750 people killed versus uh, what the 700 people dying per day uh, in Gaza right now. But I want to get your general thoughts on that before we continue, Jamu. Anything you want to add? Uh, your general thoughts on what Israel's doing? What Israel's engaging is racist genocide. And the very fact that it could be justified it has to be a wake up call to, to all of us who have an ounce of morality. And in particular for black folks and indigenous people mm-hmm. and Latinos, that basically what is dem- being demonstrated in Gaza is that your lives don't matter. That basically the white lives matter more movement uh, has demonstrated that you know they will shoot and kill and murder uh, and justify it uh, and have support in the white West. Now, some people get uncomfortable when you, you bring in these racial terms, but I make the argument, someone argued, someone tell me that the scenes that we have witnessed, that first 24 hours, scenes of Palestinians running from their buildings as they're being blown up by the Israelis, if those were Russians or any other European population, not only would there be an outcry, it would be people talking about sanctions and uh, inter- international criminal court uh, 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 prosecutions. It would be outrageous, okay? But because these are non-Europeans, their lives don't matter. And people need to understand that. This is what has helped to clarify the politics of the moment, okay? That these folks, these these. These Europeans who see their hegemony slipping away, they have decided that they're going to jettison uh, liberal values, that they are going to not worry about international law, that they are going to depend on one thing and one thing only, naked power. Okay, So, yeah, this is incredible. I mean, the, the very fact that we are witnessing this genocide and the international community seems to be completely unable to stop it. It shows you where the real power is, uh, and it shows you uh, uh, who the real uh, 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 threats are to uh, global collective humanity. Yeah, all I've been doing, and I'm glad to get your perspective, John Lou. I asked Mark Kimberly essentially the same question uh, because all I have is race tweets. <laughs> That's all I've been doing for the last week or two, trying to grasp what the hell we are seeing. We are seeing history, fam. Like you got to see the numbers. We are witnessing, and I've seen a lot. I've been covering this for a long time. Margaret said as well. She, we've been covering it for a long time. Never seen anything like this. And just the disregard for Palestinian lives. Now, with that said, you want to know who one of the chief uh, people who are guilty of this? Well, obviously the entire duopoly, but it's Someone who was the progressive darling, someone who was deeply supported by Crystal and Kyle, by the Vanguard, by all these people who have a lot of mean things they've already been in our analysis as that was propping up this psychopath. So uh, I, I know one way to tell 
if a politician is going to be a genocide supporting maniac, if they don't know, put a shotgun on a black jogger before. I'm just saying, I think the correlation there is <laughs> kind of fucking, I think that's like a 90, 90% chance that if someone put a shotgun on a black jogger, there's a good chance this motherfucker will support genocide as a standard. And that another thing they hate us for because we was there on the front line, CJ. I don't know how much you guys remember. Obviously, I remember the John yeah. and Margo and our great friends that fought for this as well. But the John Fetterman Psyop, where, where they were like, this is a new, we got we got a chance to get a new Bernie Sanders. Do you guys remember this? This bullshit that people was running? He's a progressive. You have like people like Mac, <laughs> like who won the who won like Kyle Polinsky's sidekicks, right? One of the people I had to break up with after I became a, a critical of Bernie. You look what he says in retaliation to what John Fetterman genocide denial that I'm going to show you here. Fetterman has completely obliterated all his credibility with the left in just two months. Two months? <laughs> Bro, John Fetterman was very vocal about the fact that he was going to be supportive of Israel. So you guys see the progressives like Mac, Vanguard, and all these people, they're pretending that John Fetterman has a new heel turn. This is something they could not have seen coming. I know we told you guys to support them on our channels. We use our platform to plat, uh, to prop up the Zionist psychopath. It's not our fault. We could have never seen this coming. Meanwhile, at our being and all the serious people, you want to know what I kept bringing up to people every opportunity I got. He's a Zionist. <laughs> this receipt. And I and I remember the critique I got where people was like, well, girl, come on, man. Why are you guys using Israel Palestine? No one, of course you're not getting. You're not gonna get someone who get Israel Palestine right. I remember that is the exact excuse. You're not gonna find a perfect candidate. You're not gonna find a perfect candidate. Like nigga, all I'm asking you is not to <laughs> want genocide amongst people. What the fuck? I'm asking you not to be a sociopath, and, a psychopath, and that's too much. And it, it, what it, what it really boils down to, and I think you see it in the numbers with when it comes to people of color and if they support this, it bears out in the numbers. It really boils down to black people feeling like uh this has a correlation or is similar or it has um similar points to what happened to our ancestors yep. and this is the reason why you saw you, you nick is talking about how rbn was out in the front lines with this guy this is the reason why we say marginalized people should be at the forefront because the marginalized people was at the forefront of the left we would have avoided this this guy right here. And but instead all we have people. white progressive instead we have white progressives aka neoliberals who are you know the biggest mouthpieces and they talk this the, the the American left into this guy who is now supporting genocide and who is <laughs> happily supporting uh genocide it just speaks to what our black radicals always told us we have we have these people who who are wolves in sheep's clothing these people who are oh i'm on your side and this and that and look what they would have had us doing nick if we followed the majority reports if we followed our white progressive allies look what they would have had us uh, uh, uh doing we would have blood on our hands for supporting people like this but, but continue sir and that's an important point. That's why this shit drove me crazy. I'm going to do this victory lap for a very long time. Because you got to see Mac. He was a big Fetterman supporter. I know that. You got to know White guy. Vanguard, white as hell. Kyle and Crystal, white as hell. They all were for the Vanguard, uh, for Fetterman. And during that time, there was a bunch of black leftists, including us, that say, this guy kind of pulled a shotgun on a black jogger. And then they got it mad at us. You had a, a dynamic where a bunch of white progressives who pretend they're woke, with then shouting down black leftists for criticizing a politician they want to see win an election. Thank you, you guys know yeah. why I got a chip on my shoulder about this now? I'm never going to let these people forget about this. Because now I'm going to show you guys the video that has these people now turning on Fetterman. Now you guys see, and I'm going to get you in there, Ron. I know you want to try me. I hear you. Yeah. You guys see how Max says he lost all credibility in just two months? <laughs> And he ranking, he do he eating well on Twitter. He got two thousand likes. All the people don't know he puts for Fetterman on his YouTube channel and on his, on his Twitter account. That's why he said that he 
obliterated his credibility in two months. So you guys see how they they get their audience to go through a storyline. He you push a trader first, and then once it become obvious that you can't politically get away with it no more, then you turn on the politician. Then you become the guy who's speaking truth to power. I'm calling this guy out. Even though he's supporting <laughs> him, you gotta see what they do. Cause he getting a lot of likes for calling this guy out that he supported. Who was calling this guy out first? Who didn't get the credit? Right, but yeah. Rome, I'm sorry. I, I, know, I, no, no. I, I, was to, I, I just wanted to add on to what you were saying about him pulling out, pulling out a shotgun, and these white leftists was apologizing to black people <laughs> for this man. Like we we haven't heard too much of it from him. We haven't heard too many apologies. We haven't, you know, he haven't gave his family reparations. Whatever the fuck they may have to go through, right? No, it's just a whole bunch of white leftists apologizing to black people for this man of. Why it? Why he's not racist? It might it's just even, uh, it's a heat of the moment type of thing. I'm Rome, like, it's yeah. even worse than that because I remember covering it. You had Fetterman give a half ass apology, and then white leftists accepted his apology on our behalf. <laughs> That's a term I remember specifically using. <laughs> yeah, all these white leftists see, see John Fetterman apologize. It's over. And then meanwhile, Black Twitter was like, "No, it's not." <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god! You know, you guys can't get over anything. See this video. They you know, how traumatizing it is to see this this six foot something skinhead, racist skinhead, with a fucking shotgun in your face. Do you know how traumatizing that is for a black man? Come on now, like y'all don't like. That's why they. That's why it's so easy to forgive and forget because they will never ever. Be, they will never walk in our shoes and they will never give a fuck. Never give a fuck about what we really have to go through and they will always prop up these type of monsters because look at it. I mean, at the end of the day, these are the same people that voted for Joe Biden and we already know what, what the fuck he didn't did to the black communities across America. The same way we prop him up and call him a hero uh, for the black people. Right? Mm -hmm. But he continuously murdered black people across the world. Deporting Haitians like is nothing. They all look the other way though. But uh, oh, Trump in office, all, all, all eyes on the border now, right? Yeah, bull fucking shit. Y'all niggas don't give a fuck about us. So now all the people who prop Fetterman up is now going ham at him, especially after this video. This video, people going after him. Let's watch it. Insanity from John Fetterman here, just straight up denying the death count that we're seeing. Uh, denying war crimes, I'd let it play. A civilian okay. death toll that has happened as a result of this war. Do you believe that anything that Israel has done in these six weeks of fighting has amounted to a war crime? Of course not. Uh, of Ask directly Did Israel commit a war crime? And he said no. No, of course not. Yeah, even worse. <laughs> even worse. Yeah, even worse. Two hundred thousand dollars said no. <laughs> that moment. That's the moment that it's getting clipped. Everyone calling this moment, and um, all the people who propped up John Fetterman is going to pretend they never did. I prop, but let's play because now you're going to hear his rationale. Has amounted to a war crime. Of course not. Uh, of of course not. And, and it's like, let's not forget what Hamas started. Oh, they broke the first ceasefire, and then they attacked Israel and murdered over 1,200 innocent willy, excuse me, women, children, babies, everything, and, and brutalized it in, in the most, you know, unspeakable <laughs> kinds of ways. Uh, and so that really is the ultimate you know, you know, criminal war uh, uh, kinds of... This is absolutely an unequiv unequivocal... Uh, attack to destroy Israel, and we must remember that that's how started all of this. But are you comfortable, Senator, with the number of Palestinians who have lost their lives? 7,000 children, 15 or 16,000 civilians dead. Do you believe Israel is doing enough to minimize civilian casualties? No. One, you know, one, one death is too, too many. It's a tragic. I don't. I don't value uh, any Palestinian child life any more than, or any less than my own child as well. Too, it's heartbreaking and it's awful, uh, you know. But I do fundamentally believe that Israel must destroy Hamas to achieve long, uh, changing uh, conditions that allow for peace to prosper.
I want to get a Jamu in here, but I said it before. When you look at the numbers, Idril has around a 97% civilian oh. death rate. Yeah. You cannot credibly say that they're fighting Hamas. That's absolute scumbag behavior by John Fairman. Anything you want to add? Uh, what's your general reaction to that, Ajama? It is is morally indefensible and, and politically backward. And the very fact that that uh, he can utter those kinds of words, take that kind of position without uh, an outcry from the public. Well, we say it's an outcry, but he should be, it should be an outcry and he should be drummed out of the Senate. Uh, for taking that kind of position. Clearly, he does not care about the lives of Palestinians. Uh, it's quite clear that the, Palest the, the Israeli authorities have decided that their strategy is to engage in a process of collective punishment. For them, uh, Hamas is not just the organization, uh, organization of Hamas, because we, they know and we know that there's other resistance groups in uh, Gaza uh, but for them, uh, the Palestinian people are Hamas. And when they talk about destroying Hamas, they, what they want to do is to destroy the Palestinian people. They want to terrorize them into ultimate submission. So the objective now for Israeli policy is to, uh, to, is to destroy the social infrastructure in Gaza, uh, to terrorize the people in submission, to uh, create a situation so terrible that they will finally be able to maybe get the Egyptians to allow the people to escape uh, into Egypt. They want to depop depopulate Gaza. Mm -hmm. They want no claims on the on the uh, oil and gas off the coast of Gaza. Uh, they want the population out of the way for the Ben Gurion uh, Canal. Uh, they want to complete the process of expelling uh, Palestinians, not only from Gaza, but remember now, we have to keep on reminding people, they are engaged in an intensified military assault on the West Bank, where there's yep. no Hamas. Yep. The, the objective for this fascist government in Israel is to push the Palestinians out of what they claim to be as, as Israel. This is their policy. And the U.S. can stop this policy tomorrow if it wanted. The, the, the Israeli government is a vassal state. It is a state in which if the, if the U.S. policymaker said, y'all got to chill, you can't go further. We're not going to allow you to go further. Then it will be stopped. But they are making these public comments like they can't control the Israelis and they are in opposition to uh, this, these, these fascistic uh, policies. But uh, we all know they've given them a green light. And that's just like Joe Biden talking about, hey, I might revoke some uh, some visas. Man, you ain't gonna do shit. <laughs> you ain't gonna Where's do Where's the call for thing? sanctions? Where's yeah, the call? Yeah, yeah. And not only that, see, we gotta keep these European uh, uh, states feet to the fire. And even some of the states that some people consider to be friends, friendly, this should be raised every other day within the context of the United Nations Security Council. Yes. Where are the Russians and the Chinese on this on this issue? Okay, mm -hmm. there's a thing called universal jurisdiction. Yeah. Okay, when you have these kind of criminal activities and criminals, yeah, a state can exercise its own uh, uh, law to 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 uh, capture and prosecute these international uh, criminals. These are criminals we are watching on front of our face. Uh, the slaughter of Palestinians, genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes. You know, where's the International Criminal Court? These people are never going to be able to re to um, to reverse the credibility, the loss of credibility they have. Never again. But and, this and is we, we just, you guys know that uh, Israel killed and I'm, I'm, some UN members, and and that's that right there is a war crime. How can he sit there? E even if you wanted to say no, not, no, no war crimes against Palestinians, but something you know, it, it you know, we had a miscalculation uh, with the UN members or whoever it may be. Doctors without borders, like come on now, that's not a war crime. Killing these people, bombing schools, churches. Exactly. Like, yeah, that is. You had, you had, you have um, Israel that killed more kids in four weeks than Putin was accused 
of kidnapping in Ukraine. Mm. Let me let me repeat that. Israel killed with the capital K killed more Palestinian children in four weeks than Putin was accused of kidnapping in Ukraine. How can you say with your soul intact that there's no genocide? I think another another way of looking at that too, another another stat to 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 quote is that uh, in four weeks more civilians were murdered in Gaza than lost their lives in 19 months in the proxy war in Ukraine. Mm-hmm. Yep. And the, the 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 Israelis have said in public, it's their policy basically to engage in collective punishment. And to target these civilians. Uh, there let me no, ch- basis, no, no ambiguity when it comes to whether or not there's war crimes and crimes against humanity. Except you the your war. one for the Europeans and one for everybody else. My uh, apologies we can shut for up that. Water, we can shut up your electricity, and it still won't be a war crime. Ain't that about a bitch? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And um just to, to kind of piggyback on what all of you have been saying um about what's happening in Israel and you're seeing uh, uh with all the protests and everything, you're seeing them kind of say things here and there in support or supposedly support of Palestine. I just want to get your reaction of what Austin, uh, what's his name? Uh, Secretary Austin says here about the strategy about them killing all of these Palestinians and what's going to result if Israel doesn't change. And I'm curious to know, because everybody's saying this is a big deal that he's saying this. And I'm curious to know your reaction to, to this and if it's a big deal, you think. This kind of a fight, the center of gravity is the civilian population. And if you drive them into the arms of the enemy, you replace a tactical victory with a strategic defeat. So I have repeatedly made clear to Israel's leaders that protecting Palestinian civilians in Gaza is both a moral responsibility and a strategic imperative. This kind of a fight. The- so if you watch cable news analysis of this, there this is a huge deal, he, you know, strategic defeat. He didn't say that it's a possibility. He is saying it's a defeat. And this person who posted it also says, there's not there's no overstating how extraordinary such a statement by the secretary of defense warning Israel it's heading towards a strategic defeat. Do you also see it as this sort of huge uh, thing um, that they're kind of making it out or painting it out to be? And what's your reaction to what he says? And do you think the U.S. really means what he's saying in these words here? I think that um, I don't think he I think he means what he's saying, but I think it is for PR purposes primarily. Mm -hmm. That basically that was communi- and should have been it was communicated to them, you know, weeks ago, uh, but not in those kind of terms. They gave a green light uh, to what they thought was going to be a quicker incursion into Gaza and a destruction of the military wing of Hamas. I don't think they understood the extent to which uh, the Israelis were going to engage this kind of indiscriminate bombing that they have been engaged in. And they didn't believe that the numbers would increase in the way they they increased. But even more importantly, because they operate from what I call the psychopathology of white supremacy, they thought that they can do this and get away with it. But they lost the narrative. They they didn't anticipate the response globally to this incur this invasion. And once they realized that the Israelis were dragging them down this rat hole in terms of undermining u.s credibility also they they wanted to to pull back but they're already so far down that rat hole they couldn't they couldn't climb out of it so this is the beginning of the public um distancing that the administration wants to pretend to engage in the the proof of the pudding is uh, to what extent do you see a change in u.s uh tactics if they're concerned about uh, the escalation of civilian death, then you will see a shift in tactics. We have not seen that. So this we have to we have to surmise is more PR than anything else. Yeah, and it, it, it kind oh, of to me. 
No, you good. You good. Uh, I'm not gonna be too long. Uh, it disgusts me. The and it, and, and it. I feel like I've been messing with my mental health. I mentioned it before, like the feeling of being gaslighted to death. Like yeah. I, as someone who covered this, because back in the day, back when I used to sell cars. I'm not following this shit. <laughs> I didn't follow this shit. It was too stressful. I know, like, fuck the government. I know they lied to me. I didn't follow it until I got a platform. Once I got a platform, I started RBN. Like, All right, it's upon myself. So I got to bring up upon myself uh, uh, to follow this bullshit. But now that I follow it all the time, I, go, I feel like I'm going crazy because I'm gaslighted to death. Because these same people <laughs> was pretending that Putin was the worst person ever for civilian casualties. A lot of it was made up. But you guys see, also. even that tone, yeah, most of it was made up, but you guys see in his tone, it's like an either or. Hey, Israel, can you stop killing kids? If you don't, you're going to suffer a defeat. How about you guys stop killing kids or we will stop arming you guys? We will, we will pull all our funds and we will lead to an ICC arrest of your leaders and your politicians. You guys notice it's not that? So there's not any moral clarity being shown by Lloyd Austin here. It's no. straight up, hey, man, this is the best way we can nudge you in the right direction. We want you to genocide these motherfuckers, too. But you got to do it over the long term. They can see what we how we do shit. That's my analysis when it came to BBC. And there's a segment where they get to eventually one of these days with Jake Tapper uh, calling these people out. And I saw it today. It was shocking. They're not doing it because they're morally against these people. But it's almost like they offended working with amateurs. Like, we are professional propagandists, and you guys are making us look bad by making us sink to your level. Yeah. So that's what Lloyd Austin is doing. He's like, nigga, I am a professional warmonger. I know how to get a genocide done. And you guys are not following the right direction. So that's why he come out, put this statement mm. out to hope. Hopefully they get on the right track. Um, but CJ, I think I, I made my point. Go ahead. Go ahead, CJ. Yeah, I was just going to show a John no, tweets just, just, here. I think go ahead. Time. Go ahead, go ahead, John. Yeah, go ahead, Jamal. I can put him up while you while you trying. Just one, just one comment. Now we are witnessing the, the graphic reality of of the attack on Gaza, and we see the response in terms of of the revulsion globally to this attack. Now the Israelis they they raise an issue that I think is a legitimate one. They're saying to the U.S., "Hold on." Now, anybody, you know, where's all this concern about, about civilians when NATO attacked Libya? Yeah. 50,000 people died in that mm -hmm. attack. Yeah. But the fact that the, but the fact that it wasn't covered like this, you know, who gives a fuck about Libyans? Okay. So they're raising these kinds of issues in terms of the U.S. policies and practices and saying this is a double standard. Y'all concerned about your prestige, you know, but we're trying to take care of our business, okay? And you all should allow us to, do, in fact, do that. You weren't concerned about that when you went in and you destroyed uh, Afghanistan and Iraq, okay? Yeah. Let us do what we need to do. We didn't hear y'all talking no sh this bullshit when y'all went into Syria, mm -hmm. okay? You know? So, hey, you know, get up off of us. And that's really what, how they've been kind of framing the shit in the background, all right? Yeah. I just wanted to cover a couple of your tweets. I mean, bangers. I, I went through your last couple of weeks. It's just a lot of bangers. I won't get to all of them, but I do want to cover a couple of them. This one right here, this is from, uh, uh, let, let me read it, and then I'll, I'll, I'll show where it's from. And it says, in this zeal to defend the indefensible in Gaza, supporters of Zionism have done what we have not been able to do in decades. Educate the public on this colonialist racist movement. Two months ago, most had never heard of Zionism. Today, millions understand and are rejecting it. That is absolutely spot on. Um, did you want to speak more to that before I bring up uh, what you're actually commenting on, which is a video from, uh, was it Ra Ralph Natler? Jerry Natler, I'm sorry. Jerry I'll be right. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Now, no, no. so go ahead. No, no, no. Okay. That, 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 that's what's so, so, so interesting because two things. Yeah, two months ago, uh, even among so called progressives, two out of 10 couldn't, de couldn't define uh, for you what Zionism was, if they even knew what it was. They hadn't even heard of it. Okay. 
But what we have now is we've had a massive public education on this concept of Zionism. We have people across the, the U.S. who are now uh, uh, grappling with this, this term. And it's been uh, uh, absolutely amazing. You have people, you got students doing the uh, teach-ins on Zionism. And that's why the authorities are so upset and so fearful about what has emerged. Now, what I responded to was <laughs> here you had uh, uh, Jerry uh, Natler, who had to, in fact, uh, uh, tell his Democrat colleagues, hey, y'all, y'all going too far on this. Because basically, you know, everybody knows this is a bullshit hustle trying to conflate uh, 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 Zionism uh, or anti-Zionism with with uh, anti-Jewishness or uh, you know anti-Judaism. Uh, uh, you know that no, this ain't this is not gonna fly. It's not gonna fly even among a progressive uh, uh, Jewish people. And so that was what I was I was responding to the, the fact of the matter that was that with this latest uh, uh, resolution in the House that they had gone too far, that people are not going to accept uh, this kind of conflation. So yes, we have to understand, and I think it's happening now, that people see Zionism for the uh, the colonialist framework that it is. And when you connect that also to the fact that, that one of the most uh, adamant, staunch supporters of apartheid in South Africa was in fact uh, the Israeli state. When you, when you throw that on, on, on black folks, they were like, it helps to it helps with the process of public education. It helps people to understand what we're really up against in terms of this settler colonial project in Israel and in the U.S. And yeah, I'm I, having I, a... I just want to say. Uh, 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 no, I wait, room. I, I just want to say to everybody who's you know holding down Palestine, Congo, and you know all all the genocides, you're holding the people down. You know, keep doing what you're doing, and feel take this as a badge of honor because one thing that you don't want to be called by this government is a supporter of them so if they're calling you something you are doing something good in the world you know because we live in the we live in the empire this is it you know this ain't like the outskirts no we are in the middle of this shit if the u.s government is calling you anti something you know a terrorist or whatever the fuck it may be they call me a terrorist multiple multiple times and that was just for marching with black lives matter they called me a terrorist for uh feeding people or just doing what i do daily do i give a fuck what a bunch of warmongers <laughs> think no no but if they I, I do if they call me a supporter I, I would if they was like oh rome you know he love us you know what i'm saying he's gonna go out there and stunt for us no so fuck fuck this bill and fuck what the fuck they call you like CJ said, why would you give a fuck what a Zionist got to say? <laughs> mm. it's, it's the Zionist. It's the yeah, level of the low. Fuck. You know, we don't we don't care about that. Call me whatever. Just don't call me a sucker. <laughs> the, uh, Ajamo, do you think now? Now Jerry Nadler, uh, you know, I give him a little bit of kudos for saying this. So this little ninety seconds I'm going to play here, but understand or. I believe that he could be saying this, willing to say something like this, is because he has constituents in his district, and he's gonna he's gonna he's gonna speak to that point. Let's listen to what Jerry says on point. More problematically, the resolution suggests that all anti-Zionism it states that all anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. That is either intellectually disingenuous or just factually wrong. That unfairly implicates many of my orthodox former constituents in Brooklyn, many of whose families rose from the ashes of the Holocaust. While most anti Semitism is indeed anti Semitic, the authors, if they were at all familiar with Jewish history and culture, should know about Jewish anti Zionism that was and is expressly not anti Semitic. This resolution ignores the fact that even today, certain orthodox Hasidic Jewish communities, Satmar in New York and others, as well as adherents of the pre-Jewish state, uh, pre-state Jewish labor movement have held views that are at odds with the modern Zionist conception. According to the Jewish encyclopedia, quote, the anti-Zionist worldview of the ultra-Orthodox groups like the Satmar Hasidim perceives Zionism and the establishment of the state of Israel as an anti-Messianic act. 
That is to say that these ultra-Orthodox Hasidic Jews believe that only the, Mess the Messiah can bring about the true Israel. And I assure you, the Satmar Hasidic Jews are certainly not anti-Semitic. I should also note that there are those who try to smear even progressive pro-Israel supporters with the inappropriate label of Israel hater or anti-Zionist. Under this resolution, those who love Israel deeply but criticize some of its policy approaches could be considered anti-Zionist. That could make every Democratic Jewish member of this body because they all criticize the, re the recent Israeli judicial reform package de facto anti-Semites. Might that be the author's intention? Uh, believe it or not, I think, Rome, I think you were speaking in terms, it, I hope it doesn't pass. I believe this resolution passed earlier today. I believe this resolution actually passed. So um, it is actually, I mean, it's a resolution. It doesn't have any any teeth, but this is what Ajamu, uh, this is what you, one of the tweets you said about it, the U.S. Congress and any other Western in institution can pass any resolution or law conflating anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism that they want. The people of the world now understand the connection and that Zionism is an oppressive colonial concept that has transformed fascism. And to your point of this tweet, Ajamu, I've been uh, doing a lot of segments on this. I'm very interested in this dynamic of protesting and how people this because this is one issue that i haven't seen people be so engaged so if i'm very curious to find out you know to learn why people are so engaged but this is one of the things that they're uh uh so engaged in so because they're engaged in a lot of young people you see this spreading all over tiktok so to your point it's like a education or maybe a re-education because they were taught a different way. It's like an education uh, for people. And what I always say about these segments that is calling us anti-Semitic and these protests, the people who in those protests aren't watching you, Fox News. They're not watching you, CNN. They're not watching you. They're not watching you. The people who are out there are the most educated on the topic. That's why uh, uh, they're they're out there. But uh, Ajamo, you you saw all of that, uh, and you you heard of all of what I said. Any any comment you wanted to say before I pass it to Nick and the, and some of the headlines he he has up here? I wanted to. to yeah, I'll just put up there while you talk. That's all. I'll just show him some. Okay. You know, I think I think you're absolutely right. And and what what is happening is we had that one of those those historical moments where there is a, a shift taking place, a shift in in consciousness that can eventually have a material consequence that is a shift in the balance of 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 forces internally okay um these young people who are being exposed to the for the first time uh to this this information who have been exposed to these horrific images it reminds me of what what happened in the 19 early 1960s when you had a whole generation of young people uh, black and white, exposed to the realities of apartheid in the South, and they were morally uh, uh, compelled, they felt, to do something about it. It shifted the, the politics of the U.S. in a very profound way. I think what we're seeing is something along those same kinds of lines, that these this, this, this is the entry point, this issue around Gaza, um, now people are grappling with these concepts of Zionism, of colonialism, of imperialism. Uh, we're helping people to make the connection between the repression being directed uh, at the Palestinians and the domestic repression that we are experiencing in the U.S. We're helping people to understand that we are talking about and looking at a global system, that at the center of this global oppressive colonial capitalist system, is the US and their Western allies. We are beginning to help people to understand that the real threat to collective global humanity is in fact coming from the West, coming from these, these, these colonial capitalist interests. And that the only way we're going to solve the problem that face all of us from Gaza to wherever is defeating these, these elements, shifting or taking power from them 
if we're ever going to be able to, to do away with colonialism, if we're ever going to be able to have real policies that will address, address the climate crisis, we've got to take power from these maniacs, from these freaks, from these enemies of humanity. People are starting to make those kind of connections. Mm -hmm. And so we are at the cups, on, on the cups of something really profound uh, in this country. But also understand this, the enemy is prepared to engage in countermeasures and they are doing that. That's why they have uh, embraced now this, this, this new uh, trope of the Hamas uh, rapists. That's why they are allowing mm. for these, these campuses to cry down on uh, a, a freedom of association and speech. They're not gonna give up willingly. Uh, and that's why the struggle is going to only intensify uh, in this country. Just want to make sure I give an update. That resolution passed. Here it goes. This tweet was six hours ago. The <laughs> House just passed HR 894, a dangerous resolution that would equate any criticism of the Israeli government to anti Semitism. Oh, 97 Dems vote, I'm sorry, 95 Dems voted yes. This is what the House is spending its time on while Palestinians in Gaza are being massacred. And it was a vote of 300 and 311 so 95 democrats uh voted against it 13 uh nay and thir and uh 92 voted present you see how weak that is that they voted present you know you, you know how cowardly you are to vote present like you can't vote no you gotta vote present you like like how yeah, how cowardly do you have to be go ahead nick well, you know this kind of I think, I think, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, if I if I if I am reading right, I believe Thomas Macy was usually consistent on this. Was one of the few people who voted against this. I saw this before we yes. were on stream. We've been having a field yes. day. I sorry if I if I overcut y'all. Know if you had to say no, 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 no. Go go ahead. Yeah, but this is what Thomas Macy posted, and Zionists are freaking the fuck out right now on Twitter about this. Probably the only time I ever liked and I ever will like a tweet from Thomas Macy. <laughs> um, he said, "These are this is Congress when it comes to American patriotism versus Zionism." Well, I wouldn't even say that true because they conflate the two together. But this is what he's saying that they care more about uh, being a representative of Israel than they do care about uh, Americans. They care more about supplying Israel with the most high tech weapons and uh, equipment than taking care of our American cities. That's the general critique, even though I don't agree with the the general right wing framework of that. But I'm gonna show you just one example, and the the replies and what I've been seeing on this <laughs> have been glorious because a ton of uh, Zion is melting down. This and I pass right back to you, CJ. Well, Chuck Schumer says, uh, Thomas Macy, you're a sitting member of Congress. This is anti Semitic, disgusting, dangerous. And exactly the type of thing I was talking about in my Senate address. Take this down. Just because he pointed out the fact that obviously everyone in Washington cares way more about Israel than they do about their own country. You know, this is a dangerous line in the sense that they are drawn for, uh, for Jewish people. And they know this. This is basically uh, Zionists tell the Jewish, the Jewish people get down or lay down roll or get rolled over you know because this this don't only you know uh this is not going to only hurt the zionists and you know uh <clears throat> in their dreams or whatever it's going to hurt the jewish community to all together like and it's already bad enough that they're not trying to differentiate each other like you know we're all jewish we all jews we all jewish like no like no you are a zionist but they are putting other jews in harm's way and they're telling them, get down or lay down, or we're going to run you over. You know, we're going to take your funding, whatever, whatever it may be. We see these people losing their livelihoods, careers, you know, uh, even you know, uh, uh, little jobs on their, on their uh, programs. They, they telling them, you know, we can we can fuck it up for you. We can get you fucked up for real. I, I, think, yeah. Romans, I think Romans making a, a, a profound point because. You know, by them attempting to try to whip everybody into ideological uh, alignment, um, and and in doing that, uh, trying to uh, conflate support for uh, Zionism as authentic, the authentic 
and only expressions of one's Jewishness, it plays right into the hands of the of those real uh, anti-Semitic elements of the radical right. They say that this, you know, the U.S. state and everything else is is, is basically controlled uh, by a cabal of of Jewish finance capitalists. Okay, so it plays into that that fascist trope. So it's a very dangerous position that they have taken, and they are playing right into the hands of the radical right. But they don't seem to understand that. And I, I, mean, I talk to people every day. Right right right. They'd be like, "Oh, the Jews, the Jews, the Jews." And I'm like, "Look, Kanye, <laughs> it's not the Jews." It's the Zionists, you know, these, this is where we're getting the two things mixed up at, you know, so yes, follow the money. If the, if the money follow you to a man who's in under a religion or what, whatever it may be, call it out. But remember, there's are, these are different types of people out here. They are, they don't even, I don't, do they even believe in the same God? I'm sorry, I'm an atheist, man. I don't really care too much about it, but I don't even believe they believe in the same gods or the way that gods will come back. So you know, I have to, you know, uh, tell people like, look, it's not them, it's them. You know, don't go out and just, you know, fuck, fuck around and get a rabbi jumped. You know, and that's what's going to happen. Yeah, you know, there's no like Herzl. Children getting shot in, in New York. All of the leading Zionists, all of the leading Zionists were secularists. None of them were religious. Yeah. They they knew from the very beginning this was a political movement. Yes, but they uh, opportunistically understood that uh, they had to make these these religious appeals yeah what they're doing to both your uh, earlier points they're actually institutionalizing the oppression that anti-zionist jewish people face where how, there's people that tell this story all the time where there's a lot of pressure in the jewish community to speak out against the state of israel because they will get they will face retaliation you already see people who speak out against Zionism and they face financial retaliation. Now imagine your community and you can get excommunicated. And I'm not even talking about just on a like professional level, but on a personal level, they can excommunicate, put pressure on you to force you to follow the Zionist project. But now you have Congress. Not only did it, do they had the personal uh impossible relationship harm that could happen, now they're taking that and they institutionalizing it. Where now, if you are a Jew, speak out against Israel, according to the United States Congress, you are a traitor to your own people. You guys see how they're making official to you guys' point, but uh, go ahead, see John. I'll pass, I'll pass yeah, it to you. It just because uh, we're winding down now. Um, we, we are very, very thankful, uh, Ajamu, for your time, very generous yeah. with your time. I thought it'd be kind of not funny, but maybe interesting to end or to end on this note with what we talk about a lot and that's the Negro servant. And I know his name is Torres, but this guy is one Negro servant. Oh here. God, man. Jesus Christ. Listen to this Who? guy on Dana Bash. This is Richie Torres. But this oh, is Jesus Negro Christ. Servant. I know what you're talking about. I was like, Who? Richie Torres of New York, who joins me now. Thank this, you so much this motherfucker for quickly here. come what for the reign of Jim Clyburn, bro. Some members. <laughs> like, bro, I have never seen anyone like he's so aggressively sold out to Israel, and it's so obvious. Like he blocks anyone who talk about his APAC funding, but he's like, I don't know how old he is. He obviously very young for someone in Congress, but he's quickly trying to become the new uh, Jim Clyburn. But I let video play. I'm not he damn old. sure can grow a uh, proper beard. I can tell by. <laughs> Why do you think it's difficult for some members of your party to unequivocally? call out the barbaric sexual violence against Israeli women? Jesus Christ. Look, there's often been a double standard uh, against Israel uh, when it comes to condemning the sheer butchery and barbarism of Hamas. Public officials have a moral obligation to speak with clarity rather than caveats. And, and I found it deeply troubling, for example, that the UN woman, the so-called women's rights arm of the United Nations went 50 days without commenting on or condemning the sexual atrocities that Hamas perpetrated against Israeli women. Uh, for me, this is not about uh, policy. It's about it's decency. It is indeed so, I mean, we, I can pause it here for my comment. Um, and then we can, we can close here uh, because he, he, 
he ramble he rambles on in this way. And the reason I wanted to play it is because Ajamu alluded to how this is one of the new things they're talking about, these uh, rape allegations, these rape uh, allegations about um, so-called Hamas. But the ultimate, one of my questions would be, okay, what is the point? Let's say we say that's true. What is your point? Are you trying to say because, let's take their point, because there's some Hamas soldiers that committed rape, that means that it's okay to kill thousands of babies is that i don't understand what is what is your point for that path of saying you must condemn and why is it a thing in the establishment and maybe you can answer this to jamu that it's condemn this it's always it's like did you condemn a mass you gotta condemn a mass you gotta condemn a mass and now it's you gotta condemn these rapists you gotta condemn these rapists and i'll say this before i pass it to you why is it this also applied to the u.s military when there's hundreds, if not thousands, of cases of, of rape inside military to military, and we don't go, oh, all of U.S. military is this, but let's, because I'm taking, let's, because we do this a lot, Ajama. We say, let's give them their point, because give them their point, you're still wrong. Give them your point. Let's say that's the case. What are you saying? A handful of Hamas people who are doing these bad things. Okay, does that make Palestinian resistance not a thing? Does that make your genocide not a thing? So I'll, I'll let you in on, on that, uh, tackle that, Ajamu, as a, one of the last things we, we talk about before we, we end with you here. And uh, I'll pass to you, Ajamu, for your reaction. Yes. I mean, basically what, 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 what you are alluding to is exactly the objective. It is to, to divert uh, attention away from the brutality of this genocidal uh, 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 policy that Israel and, and the U.S., are engaged in, in in Gaza and to put the onus on the Palestinians is also is to justify that is to say basically is to, it is to embrace and be in alignment with the uh, positions of some of the most rapidly right wing elements in the Netanyahu government who said that what we're dealing with are in fact human animals. So this line is to is to is to prop that up that basically it's not about just Hamas, it's about the community that, that produce Hamas and, and supports Hamas is about the Palestinian people in Gaza. And so this is what the line is, is about, you know, a justification for murder. It is to make the Palestinians more killable. This is what the colonialists have done for years. You know, in the popular imagination, it is the, uh, the, the, the indigenous people who did the, the, the scalping. OK, but we know that in reality, it was the settlers that introduced scalping as proof when you, to, to mur that you murdered uh, an indigenous person so you can collect your bounty. OK, so this they've always projected their bullshit onto onto the, the, the victims, the real victims. And the, the whole narrative is trying to regain the narrative that. Uh, the, the, the Jews or the, the, the Israeli citizens are, in fact, the victims. They are, in fact, the perpetrators. We've got to continually remind people of that. This is a, a horrendously uh, barbaric line to take. They, they threw out the anti-Semitic thing by itself. It didn't have legs. Now they're connecting up this. They bring it back in this, this rape uh, trope, you know, because they have basically lost the narrative. And this, this I don't think they're going to regain it back. Um, but I like that line. I'll pass it to you, Rome, to close. But it says, make them more killable. And that is the strategy of white supremacy for all the black and brown indigenous people they're killing everywhere. What do they make of us? They criminalize us to make us what? More killable. They criminalize the people in Middle East, you call them terrorists, to make them more killable. You criminalize people down, you know, you call uh, uh, Maduro, you call, give him a name, a dictator. It makes it, it makes it more, more doable to do their imperialist acts, whether it's killing, whether it's taking land, whether it's stealing resources, it makes it, it more believable. If, because it's like, it's, like, it's like when you see propaganda, it's like you literally see in America propaganda, you literally see on TV, let's say uh, uh, Blue, whatever that show was called, Police brutality, but if you make the criminal unlikable, it's like, oh, it's okay. 
it's okay to do police reality to that guy. You know what I'm saying? It's the same sort of concept from white supremacy. But I, I do want to thank Ajamu for his time. I know you've been here for a long time, and I, I know it might be late where you are. I'll pass to you, Ron, for, for anything you were going to say. Uh, well, I had a time. I, I went yeah, as... Go ahead, uh, Ron. Go ahead, Ron. Go ahead, Ron. I love, oh, I love no, I, I just wanted to uh, you know add on to what y'all was saying. Like, if that's justification for, for murder and genocide, then... You know, I just say, you know, hey, let's do our thing then, because uh, we have more than enough reason to uh, to call out for genocide. You know, uh, I don't, I don't even, I don't even mean slavery. We can just take it back to the Jim Crow days. I still won't pay back for that. I still won't pay back for put, for, from uh, putting crack in my fuck in my fucking neighborhoods. I won't, I won't pay back from y'all building more prisons and school in Detroit. That's what I won't pay back for. So if 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 that's all it takes. You to be hateful. You didn't. You didn't like not like gay people. You did not uh, like trans people. That's all it takes. That's all it takes to call for genocide. Then white people should be looking the fuck out. Y'all should be afraid. And I mean, from non-racist to racist, if that's all it takes. You said it, not me. I'm just saying. I'm taking your words. Now you don't like that, right? You, you're afraid. This is shit that we have to live through day to day when we get demonized. They call they call us rapists and all that shit. This is why I'm looking at it like I'm not falling for that bullshit. This is the same thing that they said about my people. We're savages. We're rapists. We're this. We're that. On both sides, both of my grandmothers are native to Americas. My grandfather's was from Africa, so I got it on both sides. They all slave, they all fucking savages, they all slaves, they all fucking rapists, they all do what the fuck they want, take what they want. But in reality, what have black people taken? What have the what have the natives of this land taken? They barely took in their fucking freedom back. But we the savages. We got a reason to be a savage. And if that's your reason, then let's just match your energy. I'm just saying, because I ain't gonna go out like that. <laughs> Trust me. I, I definitely, I definitely had to try, man, because I wanted to cover this, but I can cover this more in detail later this week. I, I have uh, Kate Clarenberg uh, from the Gray Zone. He joined us on, he joined me on Thursday. Um, but you guys know why they used to your question, CJ. You guys know why they use that term? Do you condemn Hamas? Do you condemn Hamas? No. Do you condemn Hamas? <laughs> you know why they do that? Because it works. Yeah. It works against social democrats. Social democrats, yeah. It works against social. Democrats. It works against people who are counter revolutionary. It works against people who are who minds are colonized. Because imagine if you're a social democrat. Imagine if you're a Marianne Williamson, for example, and you say the nice thing about Palestinian, but you don't believe in Palestinian armed resistance because she does not. Mm -hmm. That what a lot of progressives said. Palestinians they don't believe in the right for Palestinians to have armed resistance. So when uh, Piers Morgan tells them, do you condemn Hamas? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I condemn Hamas. Checkmate. <laughs> Nigga, if you condemn Hamas, you might well set the talking points. If if you condemn Hamas, you believe Hamas is as evil as they say they are, why aren't you supporting what they're doing? The reason I don't, because I don't believe it. Because I don't believe it. I don't condemn Hamas. Because what I would do, you got to know, I'm not getting these interviews. No, these niggas don't want the funk. Because what I would say, hey, do you condemn Hamas? No, I don't. Do you condemn Israel? No, yes. I do not. Do you condemn Israel? I do. Explain why. Yeah. They will say, they will say, why don't you condemn Hamas? I will say because I support people right to arm self-resistance. Now, why don't you, why don't you condemn Israel? And if someone don't condemn Israel, they got to essentially apologize for colonialism. And then people's positions are clear. The people who are anti-colonial will side with me. That's exactly what we want. We want people positions to be clear. But you notice how the social democrats who don't believe in revolutionary change, who don't believe in armed resistance, mm -hmm. they have to accept the premise of condemning Hamas. And then that immediately disarms their argument and now they are right for the for the pickings. I don't think they're the right thing. Another reason why they can't deal with my argument is because we actually we, we report facts on the ground as we know it. I don't I, I don't problem. even I don't even deal with the concept of Hamas. I, I talk about Palestinian resistance. Yeah, I think you play you play into their open. hands when you start talking about Hamas. It ain't about Hamas. Is about the yeah. Palestinian and the Palestinian yeah. resistance. And yeah, I'm clear. I condemn Israel. Israel is an illegitimate state. I'm not going to condemn the Palestinian resistance. They have a collective right to fight against oppression and colonialism. Straight up, that's it. 
Yeah, well, and, uh, and like we don't, we don't condemn them. Just like we don't, we wouldn't condemn the Black Panther Party. We wouldn't condemn BDS, whoever it may be. You know who's taking up arms against the powers that be. There's no Nate way. Turner. Gonna, How about Nate, Nate, Nate Turner? Turner? You you got you literally. Is have, <laughs> this isn't a war. Like and and I know a lot of people like to use that word. This isn't a war because they don't have an established military. They don't have an established army. This is ethnic cleansing <laughs> against people who's trying, uh, they're trying their best to stay alive. They're trying their best to stay alive. This isn't a war because if that was the case, shit, Hamas or, or just the resistance to be like, look, we can go nuke for nuke. We can go army for army. We can go, you know, a uh, uh, soldier for soldier if that was a war, but it's not it's ethnic cleansing, and I'll be damned if I sit here as a black man in America of all places and condemn no, another motherfucking freedom fighter. One last thing I want to say shit. before we get John out here, because I want to make sure I get on topic, because I think I want to make sure I get a chance to chime in on that. Um, is the rape thing we covered it yesterday, and I'm and maybe Thursday, but I'm definitely doing the live stream live stream on the article that Scott Ritter just wrote, where he talks about October seventh. And Scott Ritter calls it the most successful military operation of this century. It's it's incredible. I got I'm all halfway into it right now. It's actually a great read. Lots of stuff I didn't know about it that he explains. One thing I know from one of my hotspot video when we covered Jericho Wall was that the Hamas operation was timed. There were certain checkpoints that Palestinian resistance fighters had to to reach. When you have a hostage taking uh, uh, military operation in general, speed is of the exit. Speed is critical for what Hamas put off. So Zionists will have us believe, and I'll pass it right to you, Jamu, because people don't critically think about these things, and I do. They will have you believe in this operation where speed is critical, where Apache helicopters are literally shooting, shooting at Hamas fighters. And you know one of the reasons why the civilian death count dropped? Because over 200 Hamas fighters died. So this is a extremely dangerous area for you being. Hundreds of your comrades are dying on the field. You got Apache helicopters shooting at you. You got checkpoints you have to reach. But Zionists will have you believe that these Hamas fighters stopped, took their time, and start raping people. <laughs> I'm sorry, though. We got Apache helicopters flying around with them shooting <laughs> people with this time operation. It's absurd. And, and the main person they are using for this claim, no one else read the testimony. Am I the only one who read it? You guys know what the testimony said? The person survived. The reason why he gave they te- they gave the testimony, you know, one the person who said the woman was raped by multiple soldiers who had the face of a blue, beautiful angel. Very weird that you can describe how beautiful her face is when you're under a pile of dead bodies. Because in the testimony, they explain the only reason why this person survived was because he put himself in a pile of dead bodies and smeared himself with blood. So despite going through the insane amount of trauma of going through the situation <laughs> where a lot of people's memories are fucked up and they can't really calculate the ongoing events, despite all the trauma going on, you got dead bodies on you, the guy's still <laughs> Like all this, CJ, he, he <laughs> able to he personally identify what this person looked like. He was able to count how many soldiers was on the scene. He was able to accurately quote what, what the woman said while he had dead bodies on him, while he had blood on him. This is, and remember, that's the same story they told you about Ukraine. Remember in Ukraine, there was yes, a story about this person who cried because he hid in dead body and smeared himself with blood. So now they're re- they repeating the same t- uh, storylines. Anyway, it's I went just long, like, I went yeah, it's just like, I'm uh, sorry, uh, Jama, we, we, we can do this all day, so sorry about that, but where can people find you, if you have any last words on any any topic we talked about, you can also chime in on that and, and let people know where can we find you, if there's any upcoming, like, direct action you want people to be aware of, anything like that, just uh, let us know. No, I just want to say I really appreciate uh, this show, I really appreciate the work that you all are doing. You know, somebody said last week, they, they can't believe that uh, you all and me are still on Twitter. So uh, you, all, you all be careful. Keep on doing what yeah. you got to do because we got to do it, you know. Uh, and we're going to do it for as long as we can. Now, yeah. we got some stuff coming up. 
you know, this this International Human Rights Day on December 10th. We're going to be putting out a statement on that, and connecting up what's happening uh, in Gaza uh, with the hypocrisy of these uh, these states that claim to be champions of human rights. Uh, on uh, December 15th in Nashville, uh, Tennessee, there's going to be the Southern Human Rights Organizing uh, Conference, SHROC. Uh, people should to, to check that out, come down for that. Uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat that date for me one more time? Uh, October, I mean, uh, to me, I mean, December uh, 15th through the 17th in Nashville, Tennessee. So I might be able to make that. Southern Human Rights Organizers Conference. Okay. Southern Human That's Rights kick off. It's, it's going to be, you know, black folk, black radicals from across the South at that conference. Uh, we're just getting prepared for 2024 and the fight that's going to take place. Please continue to support the uh, uh, Black Agenda Report. Uh, you know, we have all of us connected trying to do this work in terms of raising people's consciousness. We got to support each other. Yes. Um, and uh, that's where I put my articles. You know, I'm going to be a little bit more prolific in 2024. But oh, can't uh, we got to fight ahead of us and we're going we gonna to fight. And you know what? We're going to win. Yeah, we said the same thing to Mark, but John, man, like I, I'm a big supporter of Black Agenda Report. Like they helped me see through a lot of things and your work. Uh, one of my favorite Twitter accounts. I love your general approach. Always great to have you on. I appreciate the approach that you have in politics. We learn a lot from you. So thank yeah. you for coming on once again, man. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. And re- appreciate it. We're going to put you in the appreciate back. Hopefully you. Rome is able to come meet you out there in in Nashville. And Rome is going to try to work yeah. on that. Maybe we'll raise some money. We Rome see what I can we see what I can do cuz I when how long until we like drive? something we want to do right there. That sounds like something. When how long until we drive to Missouri to Kentucky? We see. Yeah. I'm like, I'll see what I <laughs> we will shall see. All right, Ajama, yeah. well, I'll put you in the back, sir, cuz we're going to ramble on maybe for a few more minutes here. Um, we got a couple of uh, super chats. Everybody, we'll, I'll probably cover. I have to push this squad story back in, again. I push the squad story. Dude, I got back, like three but, stories in the holster, fam. <laughs> like, bro, yeah, I got so much like, to that's just how it. That's how it goes. It we push no, it never gonna catch up. <laughs> We're coming. Uh, so Friday, Friday is my birthday. Friday, we got Maximilian oh. from uh, the Real News Network. We'll be here. We have. Today you said Thursday you got Kit oh, Kit Clamberg yeah from the Great Wow Zone. and and um somebody else confirmed I got to look at Zoya told me somebody and I may confirmed. and I, I may hit someone else on, on for Thursday as well I'm, I'm trying to throw an anti imperialist panel but for for sure we're gonna have Kit on that's just an idea we're trying to throw an anti imperialist panel for Thursday but for sure Kit uh yeah I'll see I see so what stick, else I can do. stay around for RBN we're trying to put together content. Rome, you always know your you, people want to see you, man. So the more often you're able to, to show up to this shit like this, man, the more uh, people uh, want to see you, as you can see in the comments, sir, if you've been watching the comments. Uh, remember, remember, people, I, well, I, I can't really talk about what we really talked about, what everything we talked about in the meeting, but we talked about sticking our heads out there a little bit more. And, you know, I'm going to be taking a break on mutual aid, trying to, you know, uh, stay focused on the library for right now, but I can I can still pop up and probably you know do some uh some walkthroughs or a couple of speeches from time to time. They ain't, they ain't really yeah. shit. Yeah, thanks yeah. for the 499 puts the mouse. So glad I voted Stein Brock in 2016. Absolutely I did too. And green again 2020. The genocide will help along by vote blue no matter who or being my daily dose of realness. Uh well said. Uh thank for the two bucks. Uh, that's the point that they will never, uh, never come to. And I, I would, I wish I, I have been watching independent media generally a lot recently, but I wish I knew what they've been saying about this. You know what I mean? Because how do they not reconcile the point that they make here? The point that we made, I made to Vaughn Faye, I made to all the people Faye. If you vote lesser to evil, if you vote Democrat, that will only sh- enable them to shift to the right. I said it to Vosh. They didn't understand my argument. They thought I was delusional. <laughs> <laughs> this thing looks crazy. They said we vote for Biden. We will they'll shift to the right. Now, everything I said in that debate, I don't think I handled that debate well to you guys. I told you guys, that, that was my first ever debate. I got angry. I didn't really handle it well in my personal opinion. But even though that was probably my worst ever performance because I, I wasn't used to that uh, kind of exchange, I still dismantled them in my opinion because everything I said fucking age like wine. Everything Vaughn said a like milk. He said, and I will never forget that they, they like lives rip free in my head, kind of. Like, he was like, if we vote for Biden, 
that will influence liberals and Democrats to be more friendly to left ideals. And that's how you drive people to the left. It's like, I didn't even know what to say to that, what? bro. I honestly was I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what? Anyway, let's move on. Idiot. Uh, thank you for two bucks. <laughs> U.S. talks of civilians to get them on his side. Um, well said. Thank for super chat. Uh, John moves to gold, as we all know. Thank for the five bucks, Kinky. Thanking a uh, John move as well. Two more super chats here. Thank for two bucks, unemployed scholar. U.S. splits group and then indoctrinates good ones. Yeah. I got I got a lecture for that, but I spare you guys. I talk about the black professional managerial class. Man. The class all the time. So I spare you guys. You guys heard it before. Uh, but that's essentially <laughs> what they're saying. So this um, is a good one right here. This is a good one. <laughs> uh, thanks for five bucks. This last one I see, uh, Duke. I uh, love this channel. Restores my mental health against mind trauma from Zionist Zeitgeist. That's a great comment. Yeah. That's why yeah. I, was anyway, that's I was like, that's a great comment. That's yeah. a great comment. Yeah. And um, I want to be around you when you cover you. that, Nick, when you cover yeah. that Richie Torres story. Because I, I, I wasn't meaning for it to be a, a whole full segment because I do want to cover that. I want to be there. But that segment, hopefully, uh, yeah, we'll I got like a few on Thursday. Yeah, I have a few segments. One thing I may cover on Thursday on Thursday because Kit and me are like, he like, bro, we gotta talk about Ukraine. So I'm pulling up Pentagon. We're gonna talk about uh, Ukraine. I put I post a hotspot video, but you guys know hotspot video is like two minutes. I always want to dive more into it. So I, I usually have like a hotspot segment, and then I do like a longer version of that segment on RB, and that's like my new pattern. So I have a hotspot video that came out before our stream where it was threatened by VHO. So I'm going to cover that in like a longer version of, of that segment, uh, maybe Thursday or Friday. But next time you guys see me, it will be Thursday. I'll pass to you, CJ and Rome. Uh, I'll see you guys later. Yeah. Rome, what's up? What's up at the library? Do you got any um, fundraisers going on that you want to shout out right here before we we get going, sir? <clears throat> oh, yeah. We had a couple of uh, updates. Let me see if I still remember how to do this. I haven't did my job in a minute, so... <laughs> okay. Uh, also, sure. I don't know what I'm doing. Okay, hold on. Oh, oh, you trying to share something? Yeah. Oh, I can just go to your page if you if you can't, because I don't see nothing at the bottom. I have I have Twitter up. So, is it on your is it on your page? Yeah, yeah. I had a couple of things. Uh. How yeah, let me it just go. Oh, that's that's our updates. video, everybody. Aha. That was us that you saw picture in picture. All right, let's go to Rome's page really quick. Here, that's that never gets old. That that uh, <laughs> on the Hitler mustache on Obama. <laughs> hey, that's, right, that's gotta... literally. I'm a I'm an artist, bro. That's literally Hitler's mustache. Literally, my nigga. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm a genius. <laughs> you, All right, you gotta tell me. <laughs> you gotta tell me. Oh, you know what? I, let me just go. Oh, yeah, just go to uh, type in library and, and go to media. It's, it's, uh, oh, the, some... that, that's some of the shit that we was doing. I, was, I just got rid of the old uh, duck work and furnace because the new duck workers ran through the ceiling. That cost me like fifteen hundred dollars just to get a little bit, like fucking three things. But yeah, it was a, uh, it was that was a lot. Uh, if you can go down from this one, uh, I'm gonna show you all my bathroom that we are working on right now. Uh, this here we go. Here go the video. If you can, you click Jesus, on this video. What the hell? That looked like damn. Whew, man, y'all don't know. Y'all don't know, man. What I'm going through, like this building is really driving me crazy, bro. I'm trying to keep my sanity. Yeah, I finally got down to the beam. I can put the sound off. If you wanted to talk, or I no, no, you can go. You can go ahead. Cause I I, I I'm explaining what's going on. Must go. Look at that. I almost killed myself, or at least my future children. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah. So everything has to go. I'm gonna replace these beams, and then once the floor is done, we're gonna move up to the ceiling. I'm gonna remove this, and I'm gonna put the ceiling up way higher. And. We're going to have it coming down at an angle. But, yes, everything has to be replaced. It's so bad, so bad. But ain't nothing that we can't do. Once the ceiling is in, then I say we can focus on the window and the door. But let's at least try to work on this floor. 
these beans and the ceiling for right now. So if anybody want to be generous and help us out. It took me. You know, uh, it was three. It was, it was a floor on there, and there was Please, two subfloors. Uh, and all of them was rotten to the core. <laughs> all of them was rotten to the core. If you can go down a couple more, I think it should be. Hold on. I got to turn the sound off so I, so I can hear you. All right. If you can go down a couple more, it should, it should, I should uh, have some uh, pictures of uh, the floor uh, door. Like, man, it's so much more I got to get rid of. It's asbestos. Like, they go the this, second this floor. That was the what second the floor that was up under there. The third floor was ceramic. So I had to take my damn sledgehammer to it. That's the second floor. This is the first floor right here. What? No, that was the third floor. I'm sorry. This is the second floor. <laughs> yeah, this this is the this one is the third floor right here. This yep, is the and that's the third floor. This is the second one. Man, I am going through hell. I did it. I, you know, I'm I'm trying my best. I can't. You know, uh, I'm not Bob the Builder. You know, I do my best. But if anybody can help us out, uh, go on my Twitter. You know, we have donation links. Like all that shit is corroded, mold, 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 mold. <laughs> and I need to get all of this shit done before the building, before the, the city come out, because they got word that I'm trying to open up a library and now they're trying to send people my way. So I need to hurry up and get this shit done. If not, I'm going to shut down the building and I'm just going to avoid them for a couple of months and try to fix it up on my own time until we are uh, uh, done and it will be uh, safe enough for the people to uh to uh to step in because right now i can't even have people walk in there illegally like if you was to walk in my building right now and say <laughs> you can sue me that's how much that's how much shit is in there so i need to treat i need i need help <laughs> so donate the tour for the poor i don't even know why i even put a motherfucking a price tag on the gold, man, because it's, it's going to cost more than 500 It's going to cost me $500 just to treat the damn wood that need to stay because I can't even get rid of all of the wood because I have to jack up the damn building, then replace certain beams, uh, uh, treat the outer layer beams, the facial boards. I can't get rid of those. It's going to be a motherfucker. But uh, we, uh, we, I'm trying my best. If I can get that base, if I can get that bathroom done, then I'm going to go up under it it's the second basement. Then we're going to treat all the wood that we can. We're going to save what we can, replace what we can, and we're going to clean it as much as possible. And that should get rid of all that mold because the uh, that should get rid of the rest of the mold and the rest of the asbestos that I couldn't get to. And once that's done, I say we can start, uh, you know, welcoming people into the building. But for right now, I just can't risk losing my building because... I wanted to hurry up, and that's what I almost messed up. I had, you know, almost bought the carpet, and I'm like, fuck it, let's just, you know what I'm saying, put people in here and let people come in and get some books, and then I'm like, nah, like, nah, nah, nah. I, I, I get the building checked again. We got asbestos. We got mold. We got some other shit that I couldn't pronounce, and, uh, yeah, it's going to be tougher than what I thought, but, you know, if anybody can do it, we can do it. If anybody gonna get the job done we we're gonna get the job done uh it's an old building it was born before my fucking grandmother so i mean it was made before my grandmother was born so hey <laughs> what, what yeah. do you uh yeah and i don't know if you've been on your chapter page yet J uh, just did a couple of upgrades um so you might see a couple of new things here detroit chapter outreach she added some of your newer p pictures on here oh i Let's forgot see. about this day Everybody get bald yeah. heads. So I was happy as hell. <laughs> uh, so yeah, and then you got the Palestinian march. We added your pictures there when you. Oops, where did I click? Oh, I clicked it all the way. So and then if you go down, you got your mutual aid request form added. Uh, we finally got it added on your page. So I can tell people what this is. So if you have a request, you you, you type in your first and last name, address, and then uh, phone number. And then you say, what do you need help with? You need some uh, higher education, housing, tenant rights. Um, this part, Nick, I mean, uh, uh, Rome, you want to get this 
Because this this is like the choices that were for savvy. In your yeah. area, you're doing some other different sort of uh, work. So you got to update this. Like, because you cut hair, you do cut lawn. That's that would be some of the things we need to add for your for your chapter. So, so everybody, you check us out. I mean, it's a slow process because we are a working class and we don't have a lot of, time, but we're slowly trying to build this community infrastructure. We're slowly, we want to show you know what we're doing in the community. This is the Long Beach one, and it's showing some of the stuff that the the, the Palestinian protests we went to. Uh, uh, so yeah, check check out the website. Also on the website, along with chapters, you can click on that merchandise item right there on the, 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 the top right there. It says RBN Merch. And when you do, this pops up. This will be the last thing, Rome, unless you had anything else. Always got to shout out our merch because um, people have been wanting us to have merchandise in it for a while. And now we finally uh, want to promote it. We got 11 designs. You can get 11 designs. You can get them either on a mug, like you see here, or you can get the same 11 designs on a tote bag. A tote bag can come in different colors. Or the same 11 designs on apparel. We got T-shirts. We got tanks. We got uh, hoodies. We got sweatshirts. Uh, something else. We got long sleeves. Um, I think that's it. So, for example, this one here. Let's click on the hoodie. Nick has the hoodie. Nick has the red one. I'm probably going to end up getting the... I'm probably uh, going to get the black one. Yeah, gray, I'm probably get, gonna, I can just get gray dirt, dirty, man. I'm just going to get it dirty. I'm probably uh, going to get the I'm, I'm going to Detroit CJ's in uh, Compton. Yeah. Well, I don't LA live in Compton, Compton anymore. Right? I don't live in Compton anymore. I'm in Long Beach, but and that's where the chapter is, is in Long Beach, even though I'm from Compton. But yeah. <laughs> QVC. I Fuck might get the black one, actually. I might get the black one, actually. The black, black or yeah, green. Black I was going to get red. Yeah, you can't. Yo, go wrong think about it. Red. All the possibilities, even if you was to get casual, you know what I'm saying? And you need a jacket to throw on. You can't go wrong with that, bro. You can't go wrong. You got with the it goes with everything Nikes, uh, 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 Reebok. Pumas, whatever, whatever's your style, that black just just goes. Yeah. This is a long sleeve. You can get it in, you can get it in what is that? It looks like brown. You can get it in white, you can get it in like an like a bluish kind of color, I guess that is. But all right, I shouted out the merchandise enough. We shout out the website, we shout out the library, uh Rome. We're gonna be coming to a close. Is there anything else before we end this, sir? Oh, um, yes, one more thing. Well, actually, two more. Uh, we're gonna be working back on the clinics pretty soon. I'm gonna be probably out by you. Okay. I'm probably gonna be out by you pretty soon. We're gonna be focusing. I'm uh, I'm working with some people out in Cuba uh, to run the uh, help run the clinic out in LA, and um, we're gonna try to get that uh, on a weekly uh, basis out there, so we can, you know, try to get a hold on uh, uh, on Skip Row. And it was one more thing. Oh, fucking donate, donate, hurry oh. up and, and subscribe to our uh, our, our uh, sub stack and donate the to tour for the poor because I really need this. I really need to get this fucking building done before they start really. I don't know who the fuck snitching on me. I think it's I think it's the church snitching on me because I didn't want to sell. And I think he actually probably sat down and think about what I said. He said. He wanted to give me $150,000 for the building. I said, dog, we paid half a million for this fucking building. No way. And he like, oh, you know, I was thinking about, you know, I'm just trying to start another church. I'm like, this was just a church. This is why I'm making it a library. I want it to be a building to actually help people. And I, I think he probably sat down and was like, hold on, what the fuck this nigga, what you mean? <laughs> what the fuck you mean a building to actually help people? Bro, y'all close your doors on the coldest days. I have yet to see the church open up their doors on the coldest winters in, in Detroit. Now, what we're going to do, the library is going to be open. I got one of my boys. He's going to be standing there, and the library is going to be open 24-7 for everybody. If you cold, knock on the door, you got a place to stay. Now, is it permanent? No, but your ass won't fucking freeze. So we're going to be we're gonna be doing our damn thing. And RBN is... Really gonna be setting some shit in stone on how the fuck to do it in a short 
in a short time span. We don't need a million followers to do it. All we need is enough support to do it. And what you guys have in our back, I'm pretty sure we can pull this off. And let me start rambling. Rachel, uh, I love you. Thank you for the $20. And thank you for thank you to everybody who's going to donate in the future, who donated in the past. Subscribe to our sub stack. Like that fucking like button. Make love to it because that's the only way you're going to see us in the future. If you do it right, you, know what I'm you do it right. You hit it just right. Hit that like button just right. I might just come back, you know. But uh, <laughs> all right, y'all. All right, everybody. Is there is no uh, outro video? We're just gonna play the little, uh, you know, the little uh, rolling clip, and we're gonna be out of here. Thank you for watching. We're out. So I'm going to introduce you to Bob Lee here and let him rap a little while. Bob. I'm a Black Panther. I'm a section leader of the Black Panther. This is part of him. He's a security man. This is Sister Ruby. Uh, we met with Junebug and his brothers uh, last Wednesday night, last week, at the Church of Three Crosses, where we both had a chance to rap, get together. Panthers are here. Are here. Panthers are here. Yeah. Bucktown. 
okay? So anyone who lives in uptown, be brown, green, yellow, purple, or pink. But I'm saying pastors are here, and you have to tell us what we can do, and what we can do together. We come here with our hearts open, you cast to supervise us, where we can be of help to you. One thing we're gonna have to do is put our heads together and figure out where we can help uptown, help the people in uptown. Right. And the thing is that, that I want everybody who's got any questions at all to speak them up and say them now. Who's here as concerned people? Who, who's here that wants to see this thing move? Yeah, man. Right on. Well, the first thing we talk about now is how we're going to organize, you know, where we're going to organize. We all of us right now, man, figure out, like, what we want. You know, what, what do we want? What do you want? What do you want, man? What do you want you know, in your community? What do you want here? Look here, man. Don't lay back on the cuts, man. And, you know, like, we're not moving, man. Is you, are you afraid of pain? You want to take berets off, man, or, or what? Uh, you uh, propose that you do a lot of marching and things like no, that? No, sir. No, sir. It seems like right, right. marches seem to do more harm than do good. No, sir. No uh, march. No, sir. The thing that we're about is that this is your community. This is your community. Let's move. Come on. You know, and we can't move without you. We can't move. We can't move without you. Like on the west side, the south side, you have a uh, basic unity to start with. Uh, you have to pull the skin coat. Right. Okay. But damn, the same thing we got to deal with is concept of poverty, man. We got to get rich color things. See? I mean, concept of the same thing that's welfare up here, people on welfare up here, that people receive ADC. Right. You know, that's police brutality up here, that's rats and roaches. That's poverty up here. That's the first thing that we can. We can unite on. That's the common thing we have, man. And we can unite on poverty and unite on the concept of poverty. You know, everything. And come color, man. Right on. Building nothing fit for dogs. Look at that. 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 Look at and put them over here in the lake somewhere. Right on. Right on. <laughs> this man, this man right here, you know, the thing he said, these are things he can start working on. He can start working on those very things. Get rid of the Urban Progress Center. Get the cats to get themselves together. Get rid of these little junky and quiet agencies the cats get them. I mean, these are the things you can start working from, man. These are the things you can start working from. Ladies, stand up and tell us some of the hell you've been going through. I did something. Show my granddaughter, Marshall. Tell them what they're doing to Eddie out there. We come out and how they talk to your mother and how they jumped yeah, on us down. Come on, don't be bashful. I talk too much. You all got to talk. Now's the time to talk. You don't want your kids to be raised up the jab you're coming through now. 